Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 10th meeting of 2022 of the Economy and Fair Work Committee. Our first item of business this morning is an evidence session as part of an inquiry into town centres and retail. The session will focus on the view from the ground. The committee will hear evidence across two panels. So I welcome our first panel this morning, uh, David Gove, Lead Officer for Town Centre Development Unit with Fife Council, uh, Jennifer Hunter, Executive Leader of Culture Accounts, uh, Roddy MacDonald, Director, Industrial Communities Alliance Scotland, and Phil Prentice, who is Chief Officer at Scotland's Town Partnership. As always, I would ask um, members and witnesses to keep questions and answers as concise as possible. Uh, members will direct questions to panel members. Uh, please don't feel that you will have to answer every question. There will be questions, but everyone will get an opportunity to speak. There will be questions directed to everyone at some point. Um, so can I start, and maybe I'm, I think I'm going to ask David to maybe answer this one first, or have a go at this, but if other people maybe have some to contribute if they, if they let me know. Um, in the session before recess, we had evidence with Professor um, Sparks, um, and he did speak about policy decisions over the years that have caused harm to town centres. And he talked about the importance of the town centre first principle being applied. So I was interested in how, from a local authority perspective, how difficult that is to implement and what maybe prevents that approach. He did talk about out of town um, developments. Um, so, if you want to have a, an, a go at that, thank you. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks for being um, I think it, it is very difficult to balance uh, out of town development uh, against town centre um, first principle. There are competing pressures. I mean, I think if you if you take a, uh, an example from Kokodi, I won't name names, but uh, a development uh, up to the west of Kokodi uh, a few years ago, which um, offered 150 new jobs, um, new jobs, I, I hasten to add, where I suspect we knew at the start that that was really going to be sucking jobs out of the town centre and had other um, consequences in that it, uh, it meant the, the closure of another big development within the town centre which has left us with a a large footprint which has been hard to fill over the years so there's that side of things um i think there's also the public perception of of what they want um, out of town is convenient um, people can go and park their cars they can walk very quickly to shops and things that they want to go and see um obviously Professor Sparks has probably talked about the, the difficulties with non-domestic rates and the, the, the kind of mismatch between what um, the real life cost of uh, out of town is compared to a town centre location, which has evolved over the years and the, the difficulties there is around that taxation system, which has, has been in place for hundreds of years effectively. Um, it's, it's just... Uh, it's it's really difficult to balance and square the circle, I suppose. Um, people want convenience. Things have moved. Shop, shopping patterns have changed over the years. Uh, people want to be able to go to one location, perhaps do one or two shops a week, where in the past, you know, you maybe had daily shops picking up things from independent uh, local retailers, uh, grocers, fish shops, butchers. And I suppose in some respects, we've seen a little bit of a, a move back towards that during the pandemic. I mean, certainly where I live in Edinburgh, uh, in Stockbridge, there's, there's been a real lift in the local independence. And, you know, I can remember there being queues waiting to get into the butchers and, and the fish shop in Stockbridge and also the bakers as well, which was a, a real change um, because in the past it's been busy, but not to that extent. Uh, so I, I think I'll leave it just there, just now, in case there's any more. Difficult. The, how the town centre first principle um, in place? I mean, how is, you know, is that particularly challenging? And is it to do with the size of the uh, community? Because you've referred to Kirkcaldy. We have other examples in Fife of smaller villages that are probably doing a bit better um, than our main towns. And Kirkcaldy's typical other towns across Scotland. How do you... I mean, Professor Sparks had talked about a moratorium on out-of-town development, but you've talked about that people like out-of-town developments. How do you kind of, 
what policies or what are what do local authorities do to try and move investment to town centres and secure it there? I, I think we've really got to reinvent the town centre. Um, it's not got to be retail focused. Retail's got a part to play. Um, I think we need to be concentrating on creating communities in town centres, um, converting lots of the, the vacant derelict space into into housing, but also the the infrastructure that goes alongside that, whether that be for um, leisure, whether that be for recreation, or whether it be for work, or, or whether that be just you know things like healthcare, for example. Um, I think that's the, the key to regenerating our town centres. All our locations are different. Not all the solutions will work in, in each location. So there's no blueprint to say, if we do X in one town, it will work in Y town. Um, I think we've got to look at what we have in place already. There are lots of great assets in town centres. There's lots of things there that we can you know, build upon. Um, I think uh, Professor Sparks mentioned something about, um, you know, people valuing place. And I think over a period of time, we've, we've lost the value in, or sense of value in, in town centres. And as I said earlier, I mean, I think to a certain extent that's come back a little bit during the pandemic with people valuing local resources a little bit more. But I think there's much more that we can do to promote that and much more that we can do to try and help um, stimulate that that kind of uh, regeneration. And we'll probably have other members who will maybe ask what some of the barriers are to that vision and what makes it difficult to deliver. But um, I was going to ask Phil Prentice from um, Scotland's Town Partnership if you would like to comment on the town centre first principle and how effectively that has been introduced or what the difficulties are in applying that. Uh, the Town Centre First Principle has been probably the single biggest tool that Scottish Government and local government have had over the last six, seven years to try and change um, some of those behaviours that David outlined. Developers like simplicity and they like uh, cheapness. They present the citizen with a uh, fait accompli. It's dependent on cars. Uh, you know, it's not sustainable. But that's an emergency. The climate emergency has crept up on us. And now we have to remove dependency on car-borne uh, development and journeys. So we have seen some steady progress with Town Centre First Principle. You know, think of good examples like Barhead, where the retail was put, as, you know, the decent-sized retail was put back into the town centre alongside council headquarters, health facilities, leisure facilities, and that created a very resilient and sustainable town that works well for the citizen population. Likewise, uh, Kilmarnock done a lot of good work around town centre, first putting a college into the town, the council headquarters. Uh, Dumbarton are, uh, have done likewise recently by moving from an out-of-town location at, at Gartshake, moving back into the town centre, which in turn brings in footfall and vibrancy. So there has been good examples, but the report that Professor Sparks led, The New Future for Scotland, Scotland's Towns, calls out the sort of systemic problems that Developers currently can still find loopholes. Uh, it is much cheaper to build big box retail and out of town destinations. But it's not just the private sector retail, it's also the wider public sector. You know, hospitals are built two, three miles out of town where it's very difficult for aging demographic to access. It's not very inclusive. We see further and higher education institutions doing the same, councils likewise, agencies. So it's, it goes much further beyond uh, just retail. A lot of our investments are built on greenfield sites, which, to be honest, given the climate emergency, isn't acceptable any longer. So we need to probably take a firmer approach. I think what Professor Sparks and the review group outlined in the, um, the new future for Scotland's Times, and then obviously the Town Centre Action Plan, Mark 2 was published last week, is to tighten up on the policy, the regulatory, the fiscal frameworks, to give the commercial sector certainty. That's really all these guys want. If we tell them you can't build on greenfield sprawl sites anymore, they will turn their investment towards the town centre and come up with innovative um, long-term sustainable solutions. So uh, between the town centre first principle and the place principle, I think we've got enough sense of direction of what we have to achieve. I think 
The Town Centre Action Plan Mark II and a new future for Scotland's towns gives everybody a route map. It is really just a question then of making sure that that happens and not taking our eye off the ball. Some of those powers are reserved, some of them are devolved. We have to find a collaborative way through all of this, but I think we have got a good route map to build on good practice that has happened so far. And we have to remember, you know, why did we start to look at our town centres? Basically, on the back of the last big crisis, which was the financial crisis, we realised that Scotland was a nation of towns, and towns are there for everybody, for the people, for the planet, for the environment, for the economy. You know, we have to nurture them. And to be fair, sometimes we lean towards the gloom and doom. Scotland has some great towns, and we've got a their storybook of our journey as a nation from early kings and parliaments and poets right through to um, industrialisation and, and modern times. We have got a strong culture. We just need to breathe a bit of life back into the heart of our town centres. OK, thank you. And that leads me nicely on to Michelle Thompson's question, and then I will bring in Colin Smith. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. I would like to direct my question to Phil and to yourself, Jennifer. Uh, we understand, and we have had a, a variety of uh, evidence of the ways that culture, leisure and tourism can support restoring town centres. But I am interested in a word that was used actually by the Scottish Town Partnership, which was about encouraging vibrancy and use of culture within that, because what we are trying to, in my view, get away from is a kind of proposition in a box because culture is living, breathing, it's creative, it's dynamic and so on. So I'd like a bit of thought from you both what your 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 insights are into that and particularly I guess highlighting some of the complexity that therefore comes with that because I'm not in any way suggesting this is easy. Perhaps Jennifer you might like to go first. Okay. Um yeah there's um there's loads that the culture sector can offer here you know, for um, all the kind of vacant retail spaces, bringing vibrancy into town centres, both in the daytime and in the nighttime economy. Um, in terms of some of the barriers to actually doing that, I just had a look at my own town centre for the purpose of this inquiry. Um, so I just phoned up, you know, the local business gateway and said, OK, if I wanted to turn some of these vacant shops into a gallery or, you know, different spaces for different use, what would I have to do? And the hoops I had to jump through were absolutely massive. It would put most people off, I think. Um, so things like the use of the building. So, you know, that's a retail unit, so you wouldn't be able to use it as a cafe. If you wanted to put a cafe in it, you'd have to get a change of use. And even then, they're only going to let you use this much of it. It depends on the square footage. And it just seems like there's barriers, barriers, barriers. So if there's something that we could do to make it easier, um, short term and long term, for people to go in and redevelop these spaces, um, to bring that vibrancy to the town centres, I think that would really help. And, and I noticed uh, in the, the kind of documents we got that you had put out a consultation to your uh, members. Have, are you able to provide any insights uh, off the back of that that helps answer this question? Yeah, so people are interested in maker spaces um, so, and, and also co-working spaces, so things like code base. So you have a lot of creative freelancers who work in their house who always have. Uh, even before the pandemic, who prefer to be out in the community. And we're kind of thinking, well, it's actually, it's not only us now. It, now you've got a lot of people working at home who don't want to be, whose employers no longer provide an office. So they can all be part of that vibrancy in the town centre as well. So you could have somewhere like what's happened at Mid Steeple, and I think the committee are, are planning to go and see. You know, that can be developed, something like that can go right across any town in Scotland. You know, there's a place... Um, in Hamilton Town Centre that I pass all the time, that was a big department store right on the edge of town, which has been vacant now for a couple of years. Be perfect for something like that, you know. Um, and that's what I think most of the creative community see in the culture community is the potential. And we're just waiting to get in, really. But at the moment, there's just so many barriers in the way that, you know, most people are just kind of individual freelancers, so they can't take on, you know, the, the amount of barriers that are there. They need some support to try and to move things on, but they would be more than willing. Can a bit bring you in, Phil, at this point? Sorry, Phil, have you got anything to, to add to the original question? Yeah, and just for the remote witnesses, the Parliament should switch your mic on and off. Are we having a difficulty with Mr Prentice? Or? Yeah, I've, 
I've, I've managed to turn my own mic on. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think culture is is a critical part of uh, bringing back the sort of vibrancy into our town centres. You know, I've, I've just said our, our, our culture is something that's really the envy of a, a lot of places in the world. We've got such a strong history and a story to tell people. So I take a look at where that has brought life back into places that we're really struggling. Campbelltown, for example. You know, Campbelltown starts off Scotland's story where, you know, the Irish monks came across. Uh, it's, got a, it's got a long history of whiskey making, which is starting to make a renaissance. But two years ago, they won Scotland's Most Improved Town Award because going from all of the sort of disinvestment around Macrahanish and the industrial decline, they've started to just work more collaboratively about their story. You know, the story of the Campbells, the story of the whiskey, tourism, the Kintyre Trail, the events and the, the festivals that they put on. Likewise, Open, 15 years open, 15 years ago, Open was a sort of almost like a saga tour destination. You know, old dusty hotels. See, now it is genuinely a hipster location with lots of new investment, restaurants. I go in and look at Open and I think the demographic has moved to be very European, middle-aged with kids jumping onto the ferries, going across to our islands. It can be done. And Open has a series of festivals bringing in the local culture so visitors, residents can all enjoy that, from music festivals to art and craft. And I take up Jennifer's points about barriers. Uh, barriers are usually around cost or process, but they can be over overcome. Look at Creative Sterling in King Street. Creative Sterling took over an old retail unit, a three-storey Wilco building, and filled it with a hundred bedroom craft and arts people, people who in their own right would never be able to take a risk on, on renting a shop, but they can rent a shop window, they can rent a bit of space within that shop to sell their goods. It gives them another channel to sell, but more importantly, it creates something very unique in the heart of Stirling, which gives lots of people a reason to go into Stirling because they see a shop selling things that they would never be able to see anywhere else. So I think where there's, where there's a will, there's a way. Culture, in my mind, is our DNA. It tells our story, and we have such a culture to celebrate. So COVID has pushed a lot of things outdoors and it did show that we could operate outdoors. So street festivals, markets, all of these types of activities should be further encouraged. Um, so they are, culture to me is the backbone of the Scottish society and we should be celebrating it more and, and just doing more around that. But there is a massive role to play. And as retail repurposes and we repopulate our town centres, people will demand more of that. You know, I, I go up to, I'll be in Oban later today at a conference, uh, speaking at a tourism conference. And when I look at the town, there are two or three shops that actually are just for local produce. So it's celebrating the provenance of Scottish food, Scottish art, Scottish craft. And again, that's a really compelling proposal, not just for resident population, but for visitor population. Um, um, is it, are there policy initiatives that the Scottish Government could choose to adopt beyond a kind of framework which has already been set out and a welcoming um, open-mindedness to the vibrancy of what you describe? But are there specific, beyond what Jennifer's already mentioned, uh, are there specific policy initiatives you think would be valuable? To, to be honest, I think all of the answers is within the new future for Scotland's towns because it, most of the barriers that Jennifer has pointed out are, are they're probably fiscal. You know, there's a scale barrier for these smaller cultural organisations to overcome, and the artificially high rental values in town centres act as a barrier. The repurposing, the VAT element acts as a barrier. If that could be sorted out, you know, you're removing the biggest issue, which is the cost risk. To, to this type of organisation. Um, I think, again, much more collaboration. So local authority will probably have surplus assets as they reimagine their estates post-pandemic. They will not need as much office space. A lot of those offices are based in town centres. There could be rental discounts given to, the, to encourage this type of activity. So I think the public estate has got a role to assist in all of that. Um, but in terms of government intervention, I think we need to move forward with the Town Centre Action Plan and we need to move forward at pace because we are in a climate emergency and all of these sort of activities go towards sustainability, community wealth building, localism, all the things that actually multiply the impact on the Scottish economy, job creation, etc. 
we just move, we need to move at a faster pace. That, that would be my ask. Deliver on what's in the town centre action plan, stick to it, uh, give certainty to the private and commercial sectors, nurture our culture uh, by whichever means possible. Uh, and, and we have the gift to do that. So it will depend on local collaboration and leadership. The government's role in that is basically the bigger policy asks that are within the town centre review. OK, thank you. I'll move on to um, Colin Smith, to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Thank, thank you very much, convener. I'm, I'm quite keen just to continue the line of question from Michelle around some of these devolved policy levers. Um, and, and maybe I can start by coming back to uh, yourself, Jennifer. Um, you know, if, you were, if you were in front of the Scottish Government, what one policy do you think they should be pursuing in order to enable, um, you know, to break down, I suppose, these barriers that, that, that you referred to? Um, well, there's a couple of things. There's rates relief. Um, I, I think that's a Scottish Government um, policy. So, you know, you could have um, incentives, you know, for anyone bringing vibrancy to a town centre through, you know, the arts, culture, creative industries, um, if, you had, if you could have rates relief there. Um, I was kind of thinking along the lines of, you know, should we be thinking about preventative health in rates? So, you know, if you're bringing, you know, social impact to the town centre, should you have rates relief on, on that, you know, basis? Climate change, are you offering people 16 hours work a week, fair work, and a kind of point system for, for how rates are paid? Because I know that that work would work out really well for arts and culture sector. Um, I guess uh, some of the other things is about the kind of networks that build these things together. So there's areas in Scotland where you have quite strong networks between the culture sector, the local authority. Um, so Paisley's built all that together because they were putting their bid for the city of culture. So during that bid process, they built this great network of people who can get behind, you know, bidding for cultural projects in the town. But um, quite often you don't have that network in many areas because there, there is no bid for culture. So um, it, it, it could work as well to kind of um, to help people come together to put bids forward. Um, statutory consultees as well. Um, we, we're never listed as statutory consultees, wherever there are as a list. <laughs> it tends to miss off uh, Creative Scotland and Historic Environment Scotland, although Historic Environment are on a lot more than Creative Scotland are. Um, so it would be good to be listed, you know, where, where there are statutory consultees and things like city deals. If we're at the table, we can do a lot more to put forward what we could offer. But the problem is quite often we're not at any of the tables. So um, it means we're not bringing the ideas of, of what could, could actually happen in the town forward. Okay, that, that's very helpful. Can, can, I, can I put the same question? Can I maybe bring Roddy and McDonald in and, just, and ask Roddy if, what his members are saying they believe that the policy initiative should be from the Scottish Government to help uh, regenerate some of those those town centres that, you, that your members obviously um, cover. Oh, th thank you very much. Um, one of the things that I think has come onto our table now is the NPF4 consultation and how we see planning in a much more holistic, joined up way. And um, I would think that would be a key policy driver as we move forward. And is there anything in particular you would like to, you, your members would like to see within NPF that, that, that would really kickstart that regeneration of our town centres? Some, some of the evidence that we've taken is that it's 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 well meaning, but um there's maybe some specifics missing. Is there, do, you, do you agree with that? Is there anything specifically you would like to see within that that'll really help our town centres? Well, there is the whole issue of of land and property development uh, where we um, where we require to look at uh, land in a much more innovative way and to assist our local authorities. Our, our 15 local authorities dealing with uh, land, one of the big issues there is the risk involved in developing land. Sometimes land that they don't actually own themselves. And I think one of the things that Scottish Parliament, government and local authorities could look at is how do we de-risk our local authorities in terms of looking at 
land and property development. And I think if we're able to sort that, that would be a really good starter for 10. So change the whole planning network, not just as planning, but as part of the whole wider flexible infrastructure approach, looking at land, land that was often not owned by the councils. How, how can we unlock that land? Sometimes there have been issues of um, compulsory order issues, compulsory sale issues. I know that is a, a, a key question for certainly one of our local authorities who have had significant issues uh, with a hotel near a station. Um, is how, how do you unlock that potential if you don't own it? And I think working with the Scottish Government to allow legislation to smooth land and property development, de-risk our local authorities, I think that certainly would be a step in the right direction. As, as, as an MSP for the south of Scotland, I know, I know the hotel and railway station very well. Um, that, that's very useful, Roddy. I, I just wonder, can you, if I've got time to bring in maybe Phil and just to touch on, Phil, you, you, you've referred to um, the report that's been published recently. We've had reports before, and you, you've given an example of Kilmarnock, for example, where there's been some good work by the council. And, you know, but if you walk down Kilmarnock High Street, you know, you, you know, the biggest, the biggest growing population, sadly, is still to let signs at the moment. So, wh why has existing policy not worked, and why, wh and how will this be any different from what's being proposed? Yeah, I think the original town centre action plan. Uh, was a wee bit like the town centre first principle. It was a principle. It wasn't a prescriptive duty. Uh, so we were working on best endeavours and where we had good local leadership. Uh, you know, we seen progress, and um, where we seen political prioritisation of the town centre, we seen progress. But there were too many loopholes, and again, some of the systemic barriers around the cost uh, inequality, etc., uh, cost imbalance. I think the new report, and um, uh, one of the key characteristics, I mean, um, we've touched on MPF4. Personally, I think MPF4 cannot deal with everything, but it does set a very strong, clear direction based on climate, based on uh, sustainability, based on equity. I do like the MPF4. I mean, it's never going to be perfect, but I think it's, it's pretty robust. One of the key things I think we need to look at is alignment of, of internal uh, government strategy. So we've got the national strategy for economic transformation, we've got digital, we've got climate, we've got culture, we've got towns and regeneration, we've got housing to 2040. If anything, I think we need to, to focus more on how they touch the touch points between each of these strategies, because very often it's the siloed working that leads to counterintuitive investments. So someone in the economy is seeking a foreign direct investment and just finds a greenfield site, whereas if we had been joined up and taken the place principle forward, we would probably have found a more centric location where the jobs would have been in the town centre and people would have been able to access that better. So I think um, it's more about alignment. We also ask for best endeavours, and I think the difference between Town Centre Action Plan 1 and Town Centre Action Plan 2 is that it's tackling promptly the elephant in the room. The last national planning framework did not mention towns. We are a nation of towns. Towns should be seen as critical in terms of our economic infrastructure, our environmental infrastructure, our social infrastructure. So towns are mentioned numerous times within MPF 4, and that is the first time that has happened. So subsequently, that should fall down to regional spatial strategies. It should fall down into local development plans and local place plans. So it is setting a really strong sense of direction in terms of the policy framework. It also tackles the other elephant in the room, which is the fiscal framework and the imbalance. You know, almost a third of our economic activity has moved online. Not all of that tax has been captured properly. So there has to be an equitable approach in terms of digital sales tax, looking at NDR and modernising the system to make it fit for purpose, looking at moratoriums for out-of-town development, which are unsustainable, dealing with the VAT issue around refurbishment and retrofit. So there's lots of things that this plan is trying to achieve. We have taken 50 years in terms of making poor planning decisions, being driven by commercial investment developer-led decisions. It will take some time to unpick all of this, but I do think the work that has been done over the last couple of years around planning, uh, the Town Centre Action Plan, the National Strategy for Economic Transformation, Housing to 2040, is basically sending us in generally the right direction. The other thing 
Colin would point out, the money, the, 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 there's, there's always the money issue, the resource issue, uh, and towns were never really seen to be a big political priority. So the last town centre action plan funded, the first one was way back in 2009. We had to wait a decade for the next uh, serious amount of funding, which was in 2018, the town centre capital fund. However, I think we're at a, a game-changing moment, both at the UK level and the Scottish level, in that the Place-Based Investment Fund has put £325 million on the table. There's an additional 50 to go to vacant and derelict land, which is targeting urban deprivation and sort of brownfield sites uh, and persistent problems within an urban environment. And we've also got 400 million, or approximately 400 million, from the UK government's levelling up fund. Now, I know there's lots of politics and all of that, and I'm not involved in the politics. I think town centres are should be apolitical because they're for everybody. But this is sustained resource over multi-year. Uh, timelines, which then allows the local leadership to actually take bigger decisions. You know, the shopping centre that's no longer viable or it's fallen down and there's no commercial interest. In the past, local government couldn't take that risk because they weren't sure that they would get sustained funding. Now that funding is in place, whether it's from UK or Scottish government, they can take those bigger decisions. And fixing the town and city centre is a one-off. Once it's done, it's done. It's not like the health budget where it's spiraling out of control with an ageing demographic. It's just a one-off hit. And I think it's something that we should consider. You know, that, to me, once it's fixed, it's fixed, certainly for a generation, um, and that's something that needs to be considered. I, I, I think there's a simplicity in all of this, Colin, that sometimes is overlooked. We have an over-provision of retail footprint. We live in a car-dominated, disaggregated um, system. We just need to unpick that gently and pull it back into the core so we can deal with climate emergency. We can have housing solutions for a changing demographic. We breathe life by putting people and things back into town centres. In my mind, it's reasonably simple in terms of trying to achieve that. OK, thank you. We are having an interesting discussion this morning. I would ask that people could be um, maybe a bit briefer in responses, just so we can try and get through as many as we can. But I will take advantage of being the convener and have a, ask a quick question around the Fraser of Allender report into the small business bonus scheme, which was commissioned by the Scottish Government, it was published recently. And Jennifer, you talked about rates relief. Does anybody have any comments on... I don't know if anyone's had a chance to look at the report, but... But that's the scheme that we have in place for rates relief. Um, is that, do you have a view on the, on the scheme or how it, how it could be applied in other areas? No, yeah, I would have to get back to you. Sorry, it's not it's not came up recently. <coughs> that's fine. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Maggie Chapman, who'll be followed by Jamie Halko Johnson. Thanks very much, convener. Good morning, everyone, and apologies that my internet is a little bit dodgy, so you, you've got audio only, but may, may, maybe that's a good thing for, for you all. Thank you very much for, for being here. I, I really, my, my line of questioning follows on from the discussion Colin um, instigated, uh, and Phil spoke very, very clearly about alignment. That was, that was one of the, the key things that, that Lee Sparks mentioned previously. And the, the challenges of siloed, siloed working, and I suppose the, 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 it, it's, it's one of my pet bugbears to siloed working not only within one layer of government, but between different layers of government and other public agencies, public bodies as well. But I wonder if, if I can bring David into this, into this discussion. David, from, from your point of view as a town centre development uh, person at, in Fife, what, what are the key things that we need to be thinking about doing differently, doing better, to ensure that between UK and Scottish governments, but also local authorities and and the other public bodies, public agencies, to, to better coordinate things, so we aren't um, reinventing the wheel in, in lots of different places. We aren't conflict. Uh, we aren't producing conflicts between between different things, because as as Phil says, you know, it's about bringing planning together. It's about uh, focusing on, on, on climate emergency and, and our bigger societal goals. But from your point of view, what are the things that we need to be doing differently or better? OK, I, I, I recognise um, what you're saying about silo working. It's it's something of a, of a bugbear of mine over a number of years, um, certainly within uh, the local authority that I work. Um, these have been challenges which gradually have been broken down um, 
I think there's now more cohesive working between departments in uh, in the council. Um, I also think that uh, the creation of STP has helped break a lot of barriers down because we're now talking to different layers of government but also other local authorities and sharing a lot more of uh, best practice, uh, a lot more ideas, a lot more debate going on about the, the town centre plight, if you like. Um, TCAP 2, um, you have to forgive me, I, I was on holiday last week so I've only looked at it very, very briefly. Um, I think that, that does give us the direction of travel that we need. Um, I think there's a lot of good stuff, as Phil's mentioned already in MPF4, that um, helps connect different functions uh, within government. And in particular, from my perspective, uh, I think one of the, the biggest barriers has been uh, traditionally the, the, the disconnect between planning and uh, the functions that we try and carry out in terms of town centre development. Um, also, the speed at which things can happen. Um, it's very frustrating for, for me as a, a town centre professional, but uh, communities in particular, they want to see change. They want to see things move at a quicker pace. They want to see things that are, are going to make their lives better. Um, and I think that's the critical part to all of this is it's, we can't just sit around waiting for things to happen. We've got to get involved Everybody's got to get involved. Everybody has a voice. Everybody needs to be moving in the same direction. Phil's mentioned uh, the climate emergency, um, and you know we, we've looked at things uh, about reusing buildings. Um, I if I remember correctly, um, Malcolm Fraser's big pitch uh, in the original town centre action plan was, "Don't demolish buildings. Reuse them." Um, and one of the key things for me is you've got to think about the emb embodied carbon in a lot of these buildings. We've got to think about them in terms of what could, could what could they do? They're not all going to be um, repurposed for housing. They're not all going to be repurposed for, for things that, you know, we might want them to be. Um, we've got to think about that community at the heart of a town centre and what that that community needs, what we need to build uh, around that. I think um, there's a lot of good work going on. I'll probably leave it there. Phil's, you know, connected into lots of different local authorities, lots of different groups, different, lots of different communities, and they'll all have different ideas about how things, things should move forward. But that's probably my take on it. Thanks very much, David. Uh, Roddy, I wonder, could I bring you in on this as well? And I suppose particularly interested in from the from your members and, and the communities that, that you, you represent. How is it that we can, I, I, I suppose, you know, we know we know some of the things that we need to do. What is it that we need to stop doing? What is it that we need to actually change? Because we we aren't we aren't getting it right in terms of alignment, policy, coherence, those kinds of things. Thank you. There is no excuse me. There is no one silver bullet here. If you go into Peralib in South Ayrshire and you go to Presswick Town, then you go to Girvan Town, everything's so different. Um, they're both on the coast, they've both got a history of tourism, they've both got a history of cultural identity. And so I think one of the things we just have to do is to be honest that we have got um, significant issues within our towns, but they've also got... Um, distinctive strong identities and I think if we start on the basis that we can find local solutions with with local networks supported by national bodies I think that is a, a big step forward I you're not pretending that there is one particular route map out of this or individual route maps on the bigger picture particularly for my 15 member authorities how do we optimise the, the new funding streams that are coming in on a UK and Scottish government level? How are we making sure that the UK Shared Prosperity Fund and the levelling up funds actually hit the spot for our communities within the context of the Community Empowerment Act 
ensuring that our communities are actually valued. It's not a tick box exercise. So, and that's hard work. It's hard work for statutory organisations to consult with local people because it's it's lengthy, it's time consuming, and it's challenging. And that my sort of creed de cour would be that we have got, if we look deeply enough, we, have, we will have distinctive solutions for each of our distinctive communities. Let's have the confidence uh, and the patience to develop those particular networks and frameworks. And let's make sure that um, when it comes to funding coming particularly from the, the UK government and the levelling up fund, that we make sure that that money hits the spot for our communities and also to protect our local authorities because it may sound um, it may sound interesting that we're going to go UK government straight to local authorities, we're going to this, the next thing. There may be political context there, but we have to protect the capacity of our local authorities to deliver. Um, and the amount of work required by officers and members to produce bids, reports, assessments is very, very sizable. So we've got to we've got to protect our local authorities, make sure that they have the capacity to deliver for our communities and also not forget about our communities from a community empowerment perspective. Hope that helps a wee bit. That, that, that's really helpful. Thanks very much, Roddy. I'll, I'll leave it there, Claire. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Jamie Halko johnson to be followed by Colin Beattie. Uh, thanks very much, um, and good morning to the panel. Can I maybe go to Phil first and then on to David with this question? Um, we've talked a lot about the kind of changes that are going to happen. Obviously, there's going to be a need to be a lot of infrastructure changes. Um, uh, you know, we've seen in recently during the pandemic um, issues around people and places and congest uh, potential congestion charging being suggested, obviously. Um, you know, there's going to need to be a lot of development in our town centres and all that has impact on them and their ability to um, certainly businesses to kind of to keep operating. And, um, I, you know, I know that when we had the tram um, debates here in Edinburgh, um, there were real concerns from a lot of businesses that the, the work as it was ongoing, um, you know, caused some to go out of business. So can I ask, given that there are a lot of businesses that are already struggling post-COVID, post the changes, or sorry, through COVID and the pandemic, um, as we transition um, to a kind of new future for our town centres, how do we make sure that that's done in a way that doesn't lose a lot of existing businesses simply because of, a, say, the disruption um, and is there a concern that actually for some of our town centres, many may, things may actually get worse before they get better? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try briefly to answer that. I mean, I, I've, I've got a long history of, of um, regeneration and infrastructure investment, and we have to be that has to be done in consultation with the business community. The businesses, are, small businesses, are the backbone of this country, uh, so we do have to make sure that any disruption is managed. And it's well communicated and planned. Uh, you know that, that's at the local government level, so it, it has to be done with planning, economic development, and close consultation with the business community. But by and large, it's usually short-term disruption for much longer-term gain. Um, hopefully, that goes some way. I do think. I do think, in honesty, probably there is a risk of some some places declining further in a short period of time, because. COVID and all of the various business supports, furlough, uh, tax reliefs, etc., have maybe kept some businesses that were already on viable on life support, given them a wee bit longer. Um, and ultimately, the, the, the truth will out, and, and these businesses will close. So we are in a period of uh, fast-paced disruption, but we do have to move at a pace, Jimmy. You know, the climate emergency is there. We can see that visibly. We have to do things more radically and faster and more aggressively to get the outcome. However, if we retain and nurture our frontages, our, our, our ground floors, the eye level stuff that make places interesting, and focus on the spaces above, what you're doing is repopulating and putting in denser consumption, more communities, passive surveillance around antisocial behaviour. You're basically, I mean, if you look at Glasgow as a good example, Glasgow is the least densely populated city centre in Europe. If you are standing in George Square at seven o'clock at night, the lights go out. If you were in Bruges or Antwerp, every space is lit up. People are living in flats. And to be fair to Glasgow, they have acknowledged that. 
a big drive for their sustainability is putting people back into the city centre, which then will secure the businesses in the city centre because they will have more consumers on their doorstep and more regular consumption. So I do think we've got a period of disruption, but to me, I look at this as a period of opportunity to do things right and to make things better in the longer term. Thanks very much on that. I mean, I think the idea of kind of repopulating our town and city centres is one that comes through a number of times um, in the evidence given to this. Um, David, if I could ask you then, as a town centre uh, development, um, somebody on the town centre development side for a council, how, how do you how do you allow that change, that transition, that development, without it impacting on the businesses you've already got there? You know, as as as, as I say, as new systems, new infrastructures put in place. Um, well, to, to uh, answer your question as best I can, I suppose, I, mean, I would agree with everything that Phil said. Um, I think the key thing for, for us is the, the consultation and putting measures in place as, as best we can to try and alleviate some of that disruption. So if I can take some sort of practical examples of um, where we've tried to alleviate pressures on some of these businesses, we have a moratorium of works at key trading periods of the year. So, for example, um, if we are carrying out public realm works, um, we'll stop uh, during the, the Christmas trading period. Um, for those that know Kakodi, there's a, a big event that happens uh, around Easter each April, well, apart from the last two years, well, previous to this year, the Lynx Market. Um, so we stop works to accommodate that, uh, which is obviously a key um, key driver for, for locals in, in the town. Um, if I take some of the historic buildings work that we do, um, we try and work with um, business owners, make sure that if we're causing any disruption through scaffolding or works, that uh, we advertise that businesses are still open. We have tried to facilitate deliveries of, of goods and services to these businesses so that, you know, if, if road networks are dug up, um, we, we get um, a solution in place where, you know, businesses can receive um, all their stock and, and every other thing, everything else that they, they require. Um, I think, but come, cutting back to what Phil said initially, I mean, it, there's, there's, there's going to be disruption in, and it is about the short term. It is, you know, for, for long term game. Um, we've really got to, to think about how we, we communicate with businesses and, uh, you know, try and alleviate and listen to what they've got to say um, as well. But at the end of the day, we need to make these changes. Things are not going to, you know, stay as they are. We, we're, we're in a. <laughs> We're on a, a path, a journey just now that um, unless we do something about it, uh, we'll have no town centres left. So I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Um, thank, thank you. you. Um, Colin Beattie to be followed by Fiona Heslop. Thank you, Peter. Um, repeatedly, this committee has heard that uh, there's no one size fits all solution uh, to support our, our town centres. But repeatedly, it's been said that in order to succeed, you've got to successfully bring together. Uh, local communities and businesses. But despite asking for examples of this, one, just one, that would be, uh, that would stand out uh, as, a, as a success, no one's been able to, to point to that. So I'm going to ask if the witnesses have any examples of how or where there's been an effective collaboration between the public and private sector, the third sector, and local communities in order to achieve a success story in a town centre. And maybe, Jennifer, I can ask you to kick off on that one. <clears throat> yeah, I think um, Huntley is interesting, Devon Projects in Huntley. Um, might be worth having a, a closer look at what's happening there. Um, they've really turned things around and more and more artists are attracted to, to go and live in Huntley and work there. And they've kind of put it on the creative cultural map a bit. Um, you know, I think five years ago, no one was really talking about Huntley, but they are now. Um, so it would be definitely worth, I think, maybe having a look into what's happening there at Deverin. Um, you've also obviously got Paisley City of Culture, all the stuff that's the, the spin-off of the, the City for Culture bid. 
V&A Dundee, um, that kind of works both ways. I mean, I'm aware where that's a city and not a town, but, you know, I think because of what was happening culturally in Dundee anyway, as an attraction for the V&A, as an attraction for the Eden Project, you know, if you have a kind of vibrant cultural place, it attracts more partnership projects. Um, so it, instead of, you know, it works both ways, things coming in as well as producing things that are there. Um, and obviously you've got um, the Dumfriest examples, which you'll already know about the Stove Network and mid Steeple Quarter, which I understand <coughs> you're going to be visiting. Um, Dunoon as well, I think, you know, the work that's been done, um, the, the, you know, Scotland's towns, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, Dunoon is really changing. There's a lot of independent businesses there, especially food and drink and arts and creative industries is taken off and I think that's another thing where if, if you give our community creative cultural community an opportunity they will go you know if there's opportunities that they can do something there that they wouldn't be able to do elsewhere then they, they'll move into that space and start taking that up so yeah it's all about incentives I think for for getting us into places to start the change it's a bit of incentive I think and, and people will go uh, North Edinburgh Arts as well might be worth a closer look David <coughs> have you got uh, any thoughts on that uh, I guess the, 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 the example that really um, floats in my mind is Loch Ellen in Fife. It was one of the first sustainable community initiative charrettes. Um, there was a lot of there was a lot of bluster about the charrette, to be honest, um, and a lot of um, enthusiasm, which has has not come through to uh, you know real life fruition, I suppose. Um, but one key project is Townhouse Square in Loch Ely. Uh, that's fra that was um, an area behind uh, a derelict church, St Andrew's Church, um, which we have repurposed with Fife Historic Buildings Trust and a community interest company called Rock Gelly into a climbing centre. Now that hopefully will open sometime this year. We've obviously been delayed because of the pandemic, but works are substantially complete. The climbing uh, tower is in place. <laughs> Um, it's just now the fit out that needs to, to be completed there. Um, townhouse Square, uh, as, it, as it may sound, is the, has, has traditional townhouse there, which had lain empty. It was a council property. Um, that's been repurposed as very nice um, affordable housing. Um, so it's on our social housing register um, for nice new flats. Um, we also built, um, I think it's 16 units alongside that uh, houses but also all our partners all valley housing association have taken on some of the ground to the south of the site and have uh, uh, developed a, a nice new town center uh, development um, so that's that's a good example i think that's come through the process from the charrette um, as some might recall Loch Gelly was voted the most improved town in scotland i think or well, probably about six or seven years ago now it's uh, it's been a bit of a blur in the last few years, um, so I think that's that's an example that's maybe worth the, the committee having a look at. I think I think it's um, important, without commenting on the examples given, to differentiate where there's been individual projects that have been tremendously successful, and where there's been a comprehensive uh, town centre plan involving the whole community and everything that's been brought to fruition and has actually made that step change that difference in the centre. Phil, can I ask you maybe to comment on that? Yeah, uh, I would point to Barhead. Um, Barhead, again, it sort of lends itself to the need for strong political leadership and long-termism. So basically, Barhead was the poor relation in East Renfrewshire. You had very affluent neighbourhoods like Newton Mearns and Gifnick on one side, and you had the post-industrial towns of Barhead and Neilston on the other side of the authority. And that came about through the 1996 uh, reorganisation of local government. Barhead, 20,000 people, post-industrial town, quite a mixed demographic, but leaning towards poverty. There was a disparity in life expectancy of 17 years between a young man born in Dunderley in Barhead and a young man born in uh, Stamperland in, in Clarkston. So the politicians got together and said, let's get a conversation going with the people. Let's see what we can do collectively as a community planning partnership. So a, new, a vision was created for Barhead, which led to all of the so subsequent investments. 
So everything can't be done by the public sector. You know, there's a certain amount of providing confidence and facilitation, and that was all done. Then the private investment followed after that. And longer term, we've got various groups like the third sector interface who are headquartered in the town, business improvement district that's in the town. So Barhead, if truth be told, Barhead's a town that you would never visit unless you had relatives there. But if you ask the people in Barhead what they think about it, they'll say it's much, much better than what it was before. We've got a health centre in the middle of the town centre. Uh, that brings in footfall. We've got a leisure centre in the middle of the town centre. Who would ever dream of doing that? We've got a small ASDA, which is now the, the typical ASDA footprint, which, to be honest, uh, we stopped them selling uh, comparison goods. We only allowed them to sell convenience, so they were only able to sell food. We weren't allowing them to sell white goods or clothing because that would have put the other businesses in town out of business. All of this was done in a long dialogue with the various community groups, the politicians, local councillors. And the truth be told, once we analysed the life expectancy, there had been improvement over a decade of nine years in life expectancy. So the health outcomes were all linked to creating a better environment, to creating more jobs, to giving people hope. So it can be done. Uh, and uh, There are numerous examples across the country where the journey has begun and there is success beginning to um, blossom. Paisley is a very good example whereby the High Street Mall has been acquired by a commercial investor, working very closely with the local government and the community that was inspired by the City of Culture bid. If you cast your mind back, and Dundee has been mentioned, Dundee lost the bid, like Paisley. Dundee lost to Hull. But you would have thought Dundee actually had won the City of Culture bid because of the investment that came, the VNA, the upgraded railway station, the Sleepers Hotel, lots of investment, better collaboration between the two shopping centres, the universities, lots of things happening. Also at the community grassroots level, there was a lot of in migration. There was the, the, the Syrian refugees, and the council and the partners in and the arts community nurtured these people coming in and created lots of activities to keep make them feel welcome, to make them feel productive and part of the local society. So it, it can be done if you get good local leadership, prioritisation and collaboration. It can be done. Just to ask one last question here. Um, during this discussion, we've been talking about all these initiatives and there's been discussion on the need for incentives. There's been discussions about uh, business rates and the potential need for uh, rates relief to, to provide that, uh, that support. Uh, and there's been talk about, uh, obviously, the online retailers and the evening up, if you like, of the playing field by bringing in digital sales tax, potentially. Looking at all this and looking at the people who are push, putting forward these initiatives and driving them, can these initiatives actually survive long term without a public subsidy in some form supporting them? Roddy, maybe I can ask you to come in on that. Is, 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 the question is, can all this be done with um, altruism and enterprise from the private sector? No, I'd, my my view is I don't think that is possible. I think I was talking. But I think there is a real benefit. Yeah, I, I think I think there is a benefit here for the private and the public sector and the public services to work together. Certainly. Um, what I would refer you back to, and I'll share this with the with the committee clerks, is a piece of research carried out by the Industrial Communities Alliance and the Centre for Towns and Key Cities Group, looking at a number of initiatives, both in Scotland, England and Wales, because the Alliance has got 60 member authorities across um, Scotland, England and Wales. And going back to your previous point, there are a number of examples of, of towns and indeed pit villages where very good practice has emerged um, in partnership with the private sector with communities and with the statutory authorities. So I'm happy to make that document called Places with Purpose available to the committee clerks to share with the members. I'm sure that'd be useful. Uh, I need to make some progress now, Mr okay. Beatty. I'll bring in Fiona Hislop to be followed by um, Gordon MacDonald. Uh, thank you. I want to come first to David Grove and then to Jennifer Hunter. Um, 
We've heard uh, from Phil about the number of different funds that are available, um, and we know from the examples that have just been given that they've succeeded because there's a common alignment between different funding streams, whether it's Heritage Environment, Creative Scotland, or at Time Centre Regeneration. But the common theme is there's a common vision about the story of the place and what they need to do. Uh, my question for, for David, though, is about um, that issue about risk aversion. And bearing in mind that many council officers involved in, in town, involved in towns have to get a return for the council. The council may own the, the properties. There's a lot of pressure financially. Um, and also, um, they're stretched in lots of different directions. So is there a danger that risk aversion can prevent the real step change that we need? And it comes down to people. So there might be available capital investment. But I want to drill down is, what is the people culture that we need and the people resource we need, and bearing in mind, if we were to take the communities and the business communities with us, and, and artists, these are often the most entrepreneurial people, but they're also running businesses, and their time and effort, they can get exhausted by constant consultation, etc. So how, how do we get that step change so people become more um, risk, of, you know, they, 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 they actually become, they embrace the entrepreneurialism and become less risk averse? Yeah, that's a key challenge. Um, there's no doubt about that. Um, I mean, we, we, we do have, as you've pointed out, um, you know, a great source of capital at the moment. But one of the key things that goes alongside that is the lack of revenue to run projects beyond um, their inception. And that's particularly uh, apparent when we're working with third sector organisations. You've, you've just referenced just there. Um, you know, they need to earn certain amounts of income through assets, if, if that's what we, we want to do, if we want to use uh, community asset transfer, or if we work with um, with community organisations to purchase buildings, which we've done th using some of the, the town centre funds uh, to repurpose long, long vacant, redundant buildings. Um, there's also an issue about the sustainability of that model, and as people grow older and or maybe move on, you know, who's going to take over uh, the running of some of these buildings, particularly in community groups, um, the skills that go alongside that. So we, we're very conscious of the fact that we need to be upskilling communities to take on ownership of buildings, if that's what they want to do, or, or certain town centre assets. Um, has it been a barrier? Yes, it has been. Um, there's no doubt about that. Um, we, we, there are risks in a lot of the things that we do, um, but we've taken the balanced view that we will will take the risks. Sometimes we get it right. Sometimes we get it wrong. Um, we won't um, won't shy away from the fact that we do make mistakes and we do get it wrong at times. Um, I think the the overall driver for this though has got to be we've got to try some things we, you know not all things will work but we know what we have to do we know we have to change uh, the future of our towns um, we maybe don't know all the dynamics within that um, but we've we've got to focus on on doing something and making a change that's in the right direction so i think to answer your question as best I can, I think we can't afford to be a risk averse. I think we have to try these things, but we have to put the mitigations in place to try and reduce the risk behind that. And, and to, to Jennifer, um, clearly the Scottish Government had encouraged a more place agenda for Creative Scotland for funding, and you've given examples of some of those areas. But in terms of resource and capacity to enable culture and heritage and, and the, that wider arts um, focus to be at the start of development rather than nice to have at the end, as some people perceive it. What people resource do you think is required to get the, that um, you know, engine of, of, of activity going? Because again, freelancers often have to have other, other jobs to help their work, etc. It's the time that's required to help th th those, those engagements. Um, what's your view on that? <clears throat> Yeah, there's, I mean, there's lots of ways that we can be involved. So it's things like, um, you know, from the kind of the festivals and events side, you know, of, of in the town centre. So, that, you know, you don't need capital for that. That's more about the town centre management coming together, working with the local creative community to say, can you help us? We want to maybe have four big focus points per year. 
what could we put on, they can work together to make applications for funding for festivals and things like that and for activity. In terms of the, the vacant buildings, that's a bit more of a challenge because if we could have more local authority ownership of those buildings in the first place, we could then work with the local authority about what the social benefit is. You know, and we could, I don't think we would need that long term funding. If, if you can take care of the rent, you know, we could be running cafes, social inclusion projects, employing people, you know, in the community with special needs who, who can't get jobs elsewhere and who can work with us and who would be welcome with us. Um, so, yeah, th there's lots of different things we could do, um, you know, w whether it's part of the kind of the the fabric of the high street or whether it's the addition. The other thing is, you know, if you do have, you know, what I've noticed about Mogai Town Centre is it basically closes down at night. It's very much a daytime economy and they do have some activities and things for kids during the day, which are all good ideas to add to the vibrancy. But come seven o'clock, nothing happens. And they could be having comedy nights, they could be having book clubs, there's all this stuff, you know, they could be doing. I don't have time to go around them all and make all these suggestions. Um, but at the moment, you know, the, the Business Improvement District are not talking to the, the people in the cultural community there and, and, and none of that kind of, those conversations are happening. So I don't know it, it, whose job it is to kick that off. Maybe the, the, the local authority culture department, I don't know. Okay, thank you. And can we move to, to Phil, if you could maybe comment, particularly Phil Prentice, on the danger of risk aversion, but also the benefit of entrepreneurialism in the public sector, as well as working with partners in the private sector. And again, su successes, I suppose, we better maybe focus on that than, than necessarily where it hasn't happened, but your reflection on what, what is good and that we can follow it on you know, perhaps what is the practice we need to try and move away from. We are very much uh, risk averse, but I, I think the pressures through a decade of austerity has put uh, local government officers in a difficult position. You know, there isn't a lot of money to go around and they've had difficult decisions to make, which has led to a culture of risk aversion. But there is resource on the table now. So I think that we're trying to do things differently at a pace. So part of the place-based investment fund we'll see a series of scalable demonstrator projects. So we are currently engaged with a number of local authorities looking at the acquisition and repurposing of large shopping centres, looking at uh, radical interventions around climate. And we can develop case studies from that and ensure with our local government colleagues and the wider public estate to see if we can get some of that moving a bit quicker. So I think it's our job at, at government level and agency level, the likes of the Towns Partnership, to actually help overcome the risk aversion and to give people confidence that, that some of these decisions just have to be taken and we have to look long term. Um, it, I, again, I, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. The, the engagement we've had with the private sector and the public sector around this could potentially lead to new financing mechanisms, new spe special purpose vehicles to get things happening. And I think the message here is not one sector will be able to stand on its own feet post pandemic and going towards climate. This is very much about taking a holistic place-based approach with all the key stakeholders involved, investing and getting returns. And, uh, and briefly going back to the deputy convener's point just to, to, about subsidy. This is not about subsidy. This is about showing the art of the possible. We need the flow of private capital back into this at a pace. And I have to say, again, I'm very encouraged that the institutional investors and pension funds are now looking seriously at town city centre housing at scale, which they can put money into investable propositions for the long term. So again, it's a mixture of private and public. Some of these things haven't been done before, Fiona. Uh, you know, the, we have to take a, a, a brave step forward. And I think the government recognised that and said, let's do some demonstrations in close consultation with COSLA, Scottish Futures Trust, Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, so we can learn from all of that. But let's just do some of these big things that we've been thinking about and talking about. Now, I sit as a director in the UK task force as well, and there has been a, a few things like that happening. But there's not a lot that we can learn from these guys. We know what needs to be done up here. I think it's just a question of focusing on doing the right thing and stopping doing the harmful things. OK, thank you. Very briefly to, to Roddy, um, just to ask about the capacity of the voluntary sector and volunteers to be involved in these big projects that we've just heard about. 
I think there is capacity. First and foremost, we need to get buy in. Uh, we have to have something that the third sector and the voluntary organisations can feel that A, they're equal partners, they're valued, their opinions are listened to. Once we, once we get that respect agenda sorted, the third sector and the voluntary organisations will come in uh, will come in very effectively. Last Friday, I spent some time at the um, Grain Exchange in Air. And, and what you have there is a really interesting combination of council offices on the top floor and the top two floors. And on the ground floor, you have got a marketplace where there is a, a mixture of groups, people, volunteers coming in, base of industries, etc. So I think there are certainly examples of where you engage with the voluntary third sector in a respectful manner, that you get a vision that is a shared vision, that isn't the vision of the government, isn't the vision of UK government, isn't the vision of the council, but is a, is a, a community vision. Then I, I reckon the capacity of the third sector and the capacity of the voluntary sector will be hugely powerful. Indeed, I would say it's actually critical to make it a, a, an authentic community response. Thank you very much. I'll pass back to the convener. Um, thank you. Uh, Gordon MacDonald, followed by Alexander Burnett. Thanks very much, convener. Uh, we've talked a lot this morning about we are starting to get the right policies in place and there's now funding becoming available so that we can tackle our, the issues of our town centres. But what I'm keen to understand is um, what are the barriers we've got to renovating empty town centre properties? Is it the VAT system? Is it the change of use regulations? Is it the absentee property owners? Or is it a need to reform the compulsory purchase system? What, what, what are the issues that we need to tackle on a practical basis in order that the policies that we're now getting in place and the funding that's becoming available can be used most effectively? And uh, just before we start, if I can come to David, I was interested in a comment you made in your written submission which was we have a culture of neglect around buildings, lands and spaces. Could you just explain that and then maybe go back to the questions? Yeah, sure. Um, one thing we, we've noticed over the years is, and particularly around uh, one of our bigger centres, Kokori, is the number of absentee landlords, which you've mentioned. Um, nobody is taking cognizance of the state of these buildings. Um, I have another hat as well. I, I work with uh, a voluntary organisation called Fife Historic Buildings Trust who, who deliver our built heritage programme on our behalf. Um, we focus very much on trying to bring regeneration, historic re regeneration programmes to, to our town centres. But um, I think the other comment that I would make is that we have... Uh, enacted a number of what we call stitch in time activities which is basically taking cherry pickers along the high street trying to remove some of the detritus the rubbish the the objects slates bits of downpipe and and guttering that potentially could be harmful to to public um to the public um we've given photographs to occupiers of the buildings we've given reports and still nothing happens and, uh, you know, we've done these exercises now uh, in some times, three or four times, and we can't keep doing it. You know, we just don't have the money to do it. And should it be the public sector's role to do that? I don't think it should. I think people, you know, they invest in, in assets, you know, and perhaps Phil made the made a comment about unrealistic rental rates from, uh, from owners. And perhaps uh, one of the issues is that... Um, you know, building owners have invested in buildings at the top of the market, and now these buildings are not worth what they once were. And, you know, they're not prepared to invest further in them. I don't know. But the, the other issue, obviously, is the absentee landlords. I mean, we've been pursuing somebody in the States for, to my knowledge, now seven years, and we've still not been able to get to do anything about a, a particular building in Kokori. So, yeah. On, on that issue of absentee landlords, um, if domestic property is left empty for more than a year, they attract double council tax. Is there a need to do something similar for non-domestic rates? I certainly think it would concentrate the mind. 
Um, I mean, th there's also an issue on listed buildings. There's a listed building in Kokori High Street, which has been the bane of my life now for nearly 15 years, and I can't get the owner to do anything with it. You know, and there's nothing that, nothing I can do particularly to make him do anything about it unless something starts falling off the building. Um, yeah, and, and it, it really lets down a, an area of the town which we call the merchants quarter where we've invested quite heavily in trying to you know get businesses working together and to create a new makers market through the the adam smith enlightenments project um it's really frustrating very frustrating okay, thanks very much if we can come to roddy and uh, ask him what you think the barriers are to renovating the empty town centre properties? It, well, we as an alliance did a fair bit of research on on the land property, derelict land property type issues. There's a number of obstacles. One is time. These issues, the issues involved in land and property by their very nature are complex. Complex not just in terms of their condition, complex not just in terms of the history of the building, but complex in terms of the ownership. So it is very difficult to um, get very quick solutions, and that can lead to despondency, cynicism, and nothing ever happens around here. That, that, that sort of, of feeling. In the past, we've had the issues around um, state aid rules, which has made things more difficult. One of the things looking forward is uh, how, how do we address it? How do we address the obstacles of of gap funding? And it, it's quite clear that um, from our authorities' perspective, we need a plentiful supply of gap funding. We need that to unlock land and development in, in our towns, in our town centres, and indeed in, in wider conurbations. Also, this this issue about um, grants and not loans. Um, our local authorities need support, they need help, and loans loans are not always or indeed often the best way of going about um, procuring land because what you then have are councils raiding, raiding their uh, reserves at a time of significant pressures on council um, resources. My final point about sharing the burden of, of, of the risking we need to have a mechanism that allows local authorities to uh, make investment decisions where they are not exposed to all of the risk. So, for example, a matching contribution from UK government or, or the devolved governments or from development agencies would spread the risk, and that would ultimately be in the interest of all the players. And those are the types of issues that have been from ongoing discussions within Scotland and with our partners in Wales and England. And Phil, can I ask you, uh, is there a need to change the VAT system um, and when you compare the rates that are applicable to new builds in terms of renovations? Yeah. Um, I, I think the VAT basically coming in at 20% is normally what would be a developer's profit. So, you know, that to me in one fell swoop answers the question. Uh, in terms of planning, uh, the MPF4 is encouraging more use of master plan consent areas. So, you know, there is a designation of permitted development within that town centre, which should allow for much more ease in terms of change of use. But, yeah, I do take your point. There's a lot of abnormals. It's hard to retrofit. You know, you need you, old buildings are leaky and you have to get them up to a certain net zero standard. So the money, that, the money that's on the table can answer some of that. In terms of CPOs, uh, I, I mean, I, I can remember using CPOs myself. I'm one of the few in Scotland that actually did that. And to answer David's question about the absentee landlord, I, I had a guy in jail in America. I just took an insurance policy out and went ahead and bought the property. You know, I just said, we need, for the betterment of the local economy, we're going to build houses here for people. I'm not letting some guy in a jail in America stop that. So I took an insurance policy out and we just demolished the property and we allowed a house builder to come in. Those skill sets are, are not readily available within local government anymore. One of the suggestions I've made to the Minister is, given the complexity of some of these big things that we're trying to achieve quickly, acquisition and repurposing of shopping centres, town centre living at scale, net zero and carbon investments, we probably need to look at some form of central resource 
made available to all of the local authorities, rather than inventing it 32 times, could we have a core team of specialised experts in terms of finance, carbon, planning, CPO legal, which then could be used and deployed by all of our local government colleagues on the wider public sector as state. So it could be skills that are already in existence in different organisations like the Futures Trust or the enterprise organisations, but could we get that bolted together in a sort of place resource to allow our local government colleagues? So David could call on that to fix Kirkcaldy. You know, that, that, that to me would be a good recommendation to take forward. But um, the point that was raised earlier, I don't think this is a long-term subsidy game. I think this is government using strategic investment to encourage the flow of private capital. And once that happens, a lot of the persistent problems will be dealt with by private investment. You know, they will not allow a reluctant absentee landlord to hold them back if they've got a huge amount of investment. They will deal with it in their own way. So I think a lot of the burden goes away from the public sector. The public sector's role then becomes we, we are the stewards, we are the facilitators, we use the planning system to help. Um, I think that's ultimately the, um, the goal that we're trying to achieve. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Um, Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Uh, David, if I could start with yourself. Uh, given your, your role and knowledge of, of council budgets. Um, you know, councils spend about you know, five billion pounds a year uh, on various you know, goods and services. I'd just be interested to hear your views uh, of how that could be used to support local businesses uh, and what we're discussing this morning. Uh, well, I, I guess the, the key thing just at the moment is uh, using local suppliers. Um, uh, something that uh, we are doing Certainly, with our work, is uh, we, we insist on using where we can, and it's not in all cases. We use local suppliers, local trades, um, local expertise. So I think that's that's the the key um, key thing to to kind of consider um, as a starting point. Um, there, there might be five billion pounds worth of uh, investment made by local authorities, but uh, my little bit um, is nowhere near that, I'm afraid. So, you know, we're we're, um, we're working on a budget at the moment of just over hundred thousand pounds of revenue a year, which goes nowhere when we're trying to support thirty-two town centres. Uh, Capital-wise, I, I think I've got a budget round about five million pounds at the moment, which is on various projects, which is is great, you know, and uh, that that's made up from you know council capital sums, but also the place-based investment program funding, and also as uh, some of the members will know, cars and uh, THI projects, which we run with Fife Historic Buildings Trust. So. Yeah, uh, coming back to you, the question. Yes, the the answer is use local. Yeah, I wasn't thinking so much of your own budget, but more of uh, your colleagues' budgets and what you might see in, in their various pots and how they could be spent in, in your field uh, and and that basically make joined up thinking. Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, other departments are doing the same now as well. Um, so, for example, if we take our, our roads and transportation department, you know, they're using local suppliers where we can. Um, one of the key uh, examples, I suppose, is, is currently what we're doing in Inverkeething as part of the Inverkeething Heritage Regeneration Programme. And we're using, it's not a local quarry, I suppose, it's up in Angus, but it's the closest we can get a geological match of stone uh, to, to, to do the, the, the new town square in, in, uh, in, 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 yeah, in Inverkeething. And we're using local... Um, Local contractors to do the work as well. So yeah, that's that's the best thank, way. Of thank, it, thank, you. Okay. thank you. And, and, and Phil, I mean, you, you've you've spoken spoken already about yeah supporting local, uh, but particularly about you know moving away from from subsidy, long term subsidy, um, and creating lasting support. I just wonder what your view is on a uh, you know Scotland first procurement policy. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm a big proponent of. I think. Uh, Procurement should be used more aggressively as an economic driver, um, because we we probably we're driven too much by price. We all just think of price, price, price. We have to get the lowest price, but ultimately we could be given large sums of money to extractive organisations who don't really have good practices around employment or taxation. And I think we really just need to be a bit cuter about 
how do we actually value what we're buying? Are there local jobs involved? Is there more resilience in, in, in supply chains and food security, et cetera? Because the, the pandemic has shown sort of both sides, the ills of globalization that doesn't work in, in certain instances, mainly economic, but then the beauty of globalization, which worked around the um, vaccines and the share knowledge around how we get out of the pandemic. Uh, but fundamentally, I would drive towards more localism because it creates more resilience in the Scottish economy and it builds a multiplier effect and it has other benefits around employment and taxation, etc. The Scotland Loves Local program is a really good example of, of potential. You know, so we have funds going out to various community groups like Jennifer's sector and business improvement districts to get them um, more gel together, thinking about localism and driving more footfall into local economies. But there's also the town and city gift card platform. So we've got 32 Scotland Loves Local town and city gift card platforms, one for each local authority. Now, initially, that was to provide local currency that excluded the online jams, that excluded gambling. It, it, it involved bricks and mortar businesses, so it was getting people back out of their homes, away from the online shopping, getting them back into their town centres, whether it was for a haircut or for banned groceries or whatever. That has now lifted to a different level because we're seeing partnerships coming forward with Scott Rail and Network Rail, so we could actually use this in partnership with corporates to incentivise people back to the office, so the ticket price could be included on the card. Historic Environment Scotland have enabled all of their destinations. The higher and further education sector are looking at this gift card as being an incentive for kids from deprived areas with high dropout rates to keep them within the education sector so they complete their journey. So there's multiple uses. The Scottish Government's food poverty team are looking at using this mechanism to take the stigma away from poverty. If you've got a gift card and you go to buy food or school uniform, nobody knows if you're rich or poor. So there's multiple deployments, but critically, this builds in a multiplier effect for Scottish-based businesses uh, or businesses with a physical footprint in Scotland. And the multiplier effect is close to two. So you go in and spend a pound, but there's three pound actually spent and everybody gets the benefit of that. So between procurement and localism, currency, etc., there are ways and means where I think a Scotland first approach initially to get out of the pandemic is definitely what I would uh, argue for. Thank you very much. Uh, as you mentioned, those gift card schemes, uh, I should just mention my uh, registered interest, and we are participants uh, of those schemes. So, uh, delighted to see those, those uh, helping local communities. Um, uh, I don't know, Jennifer and then Roddy, do you, would you like to add anything? I think just that Jennifer and Roddy are brief because we're coming to the end of the session. Thank you. Yep, just briefly to say that. Um, you know, having worked in the music industry and seen it disappear onto digital before my eyes, um, I think these things happen always quicker than we think they're going to. And I think retail is in decline. I think obviously food and drink um, will stay around. So I think we have to consider what a town centre is for. And I don't think the future of it is going to buy things. I don't think it's commercial. I think it's things like nursery spaces, um, healthcare, um, it, and to get together. And I think that, you know, we have to make them, I, I think at the moment people go to the town centre as an opportunity to connect and belong in that community. And I think that we just have to keep providing opportunities for connection and belonging, because that's what town centres are. And I think a lot of people who walk along the high street that really want to buy anything. They're just maybe hoping to bump into someone and have a wee chat. There's more chance of that happening if you go to the town centre. So yeah, just remembering that, you know, retail is in decline. And the future is about, you know, what is the motivation for going to the town centre and opportunities for connection and belonging. Thank you very much. And uh, Roddy, very briefly. Very briefly, just to say that from an alliance perspective, in terms of own research, we need to focus on the, the distinctive, strong identities of these places, their history, their current challenges, and from there shape, shape the future plans. And there's not one silver bullet for all of our town centre communities within Scotland or indeed in thank, thank you very much, Rodian. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, thank you. That now brings us to the end of the session. Um, I'd like to thank all the witnesses for their contribution this morning. We will briefly suspend while we change over the witnesses.
Uh, may I now welcome the second panel this morning. We are joined by Danny Seapok, Development Manager of Love Our Lang Toon, uh, Anthea Coulter, Chief Officer and Business Manager, Clark Manager, Third Sector Interface, Gemma Cruikshank, Manager of Embrace Elgin Bid, and Mark Dara, Vice Chair of One and Lithgow Bid. Um, as always, can I ask members and witnesses to keep their questions and answers as concise as possible. Uh, members will direct questions to panel members. Uh, you may not have the opportunity to answer every question, but you will have a chance to contribute um, this morning. Um, can I start by asking a few questions about uh, the, the bids? Uh, we do have two representatives here um, from bids this morning, and so I'm going to go to Mark um, first of all. I'm interested in what are the key challenges in establishing a bid and what some of the limits of a bid might be. This morning on the first panel, we did hear about the importance of community engagements and bids are a bit more business focused. And Culture Counts did also express concerns that they didn't feel they were always engaged in, in the bid. They weren't always, culture wasn't always considered. So Mark, do you want to say maybe something about the key challenges in establishing a bid and what the limits of a bid might be? Yeah. Um, I think the biggest challenge with the bid is um, just getting everybody engaged uh, from a community point of view in the business. Ours is slightly different in terms of we were the first bid to bring two bids together as well for our industrial state and the town centre to, to give one big focus. Um, we also try and work with the community groups as well. There's, there's numerous within our town um, to try and engage the community in, in greater aspects so that you can achieve more. Um, one of the, the big challenges you've got is businesses see it as another cost they've got especially with the increase in business rates and tax and other things like that as well and just the general costs of energy and everything else that's going on um and it's also you know the challenges then is how big of things can you deliver so i think the bid is a great platform and it's essential for a lot of towns in terms of creating that business focus and achieving the bigger ambitions and um, but it's how we are able to work with all groups local authorities to bring the funding in to be able to deliver those bigger projects so it's, it's about enabling the bid to be able to do that is one of the biggest challenges we've got and having a bit of trust and empowerment to, to deliver as well some of the bigger schemes that we can do in Gemma, in, last week Professor Sparks did talk about sometimes maybe having to look at a super bid. So it's interesting that the Lithgow did bring together two existing bids to try and create uh, more momentum. Um, Gemma, do you want to say a bit about the challenges that bids face in being established and continuing? Yeah, um, I kind of agree with what Mark's just said. To be honest, we kind of have the same issue. Um, I think trying to get the community engagement, um, a lot of people don't actually understand what a bid is. Um, and I do think as well, the cost at the moment is, that's what worries me, obviously, if we're going to reballot, is how do, you know, how do we actually say to businesses, well, this is what we're worth, you know, we are worth paying this extra cost. Because um, at the moment, businesses are just looking, how can they cut all their costs? Um, and the bids might be like the first kind of thing that they think could go. Um, I do think they're really valuable in, um, especially smaller towns, um, you know, where, well, obviously, I'm based in Elgin. Um, a lot of businesses there, they weren't online. Um, they were all very small independent businesses. Um, and I do think they see the benefit because we can obviously help market them. We kind of try and increase the footfall. Um, we do also have the Visit Murray's Bayside bid, which is there as well. So it's for the area as opposed to the city centre. Um, so we do work closely together. So we've got both parts there um, looking to help you know, increase the footfall, increase the engagement. And Visit Murray Speyside has been great in obviously putting Elgin on the, the tourist map. Um, but I do think the kind of general challenges are delivering the projects, um, especially with us being such a small bid, um, we don't actually get the, you know, a huge budget. So being able to deliver something that they actually see as huge value, value is quite difficult. So we do rely on applying for funding, getting that extra income to actually be able to increase what we do. Um, so that is probably one of our main challenges is obviously trying to find funding um, to deliver projects that are worthwhile to our members. Thank you, Gemma. And Danny, do you want to reflect a bit on bids? Because Kirkcaldy did originally have a bid and um, I think that lost the ballot. We now have Langford Langton. What's, did you have any reflections on the effectiveness of bids or and what Love Our Langton is doing that's different from a bid? Uh, well, I what I'm hearing um, from the two colleagues here is uh, very similar to what, what was happening in Kirkcaldy as well. 
Um, the Kirkcaldy for All, which was the bid company that ran for two terms, they didn't actually lose a final ballot. They just decided not to have one. Um, and a lot of that was due to some of the... Um, so Kirkcaldy's big town had uh, the big media retailers there. Uh, by the time it was coming up to their second ballot, um, a lot of these retailers had gone. Um, and of course, that kind of affects uh, that. Well, you know, the ballot's quite complicated in terms of establishing the bid. So they didn't run again. Um, but when the bid was there, I was actually the area manager in Kirkcaldy for the council at the time, and we worked very closely with the bid. And um, I, I certainly felt that partnership working we had, because uh, well, as you know, the, the five councils got local area committees. And our, you know, like all the area committees, having that um, localised approach and working with the bid, um, we felt uh, did bring some benefits to the town, um, particularly in things like organising events, um, getting to understand some of the challenges of the businesses, but having that, that what I thought was a really important liaison and shared sense of purpose. And together we actually set up... A, a group called Kirkcaldy's Ambitions, which brought together the council, the private sector in terms of the bid and the businesses, and some other third sector organisations. And I think having that collaboration at the time was really, really helpful. Um, and that's certainly one of the most, I think, important bids. Whether it, things, whether it's a bid or a third sector organisation, is if you can create that collaboration between, across these sectors then you can start to see the results of it. And why is Lover Langton different from a bit? Uh, we've not got as much money, would be the first thing I would say, but we, we obviously don't have the levy. Um, so we are very much... A, a, we, we're currently a community interest company, but we're looking to um, get charitable status um, because we want to get into um, a lot more of creating employability and definitely getting into community wealth building. So we are a local community-led independent group. And one of the advantages that brings that we find is we're seen as a bit of an honest broker. So we're not the council. Um, we, are, we are very much a local group um, and we have made these connections with our, as best we can with our local community. So we managed to get funding to uh, get a group of architect an architectural firm to help us to look at um, ideas of repurposing uh, some of the big, large, empty retail units we are left with now. Um, and because we, uh, and the architects we use are, do have a bit of a social conscience, are used to this kind of work, and because we were able to provide the kind of visuals and thoughts and concepts and we'd already done a lot of online kind of webinars and involved the local community. Um, it gave us an opportunity to go out um, and speak to people actually face to face and talk about what they saw as the future for the town centre. And I think when you have that kind of sense of being the local community, and if you're in Kirkcaldy and you're seen as love your long tune, people see that connection. Um, and it certainly helps us in terms of that community engagement approach. Do you think Kirkcaldy not having a bid is due to the downturn in retail? But it's difficult to re-establish it given there's the, the degree of empty units at scale that Kirkcaldy has? Yeah, I think that was certainly a big feature. Um, I wouldn't like to think I could talk on behalf of the bid at the time, um, but I think that was, that was a, a feature as well. Okay. Um, and uh, something we mentioned, you know, we talk about life cycles at town centres. So, well, the fundamental issues of what's affected town centres affects towns up and down the length and breadth of the UK. It all depends on what part of the town is in. So we just had a very particularly bad patch where um, at that time a lot of the big national retailers and the multiples were pulling out the town centre and either just going online um, or moving up to the retail park. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'll move on to Michelle Thompson. Uh, I don't know if uh, all of you heard the earlier panel, but I was exploring uh, the multitude of ways that cultural leisure and tourism can support recovery of, of town centres. 
and I in particular am interested in the creative ways that you can you can do that uh, rather than passive ways, which I kind of described of putting something in a box in a in a what was formerly a retail unit. It's still intrinsically passive because I see it as a main, particularly the cultural element contributor to vibrancy. So it was just to see uh, very quickly because I know we've got a lot to get through. If there are any creative ideas, particularly that can translate into policy initiatives for government as compared to other different agencies. So whoever wants to go first is fine. I'm going to have to pick somebody, am I? <laughs> Danny. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, um, as I mentioned earlier, we did do a consultation process. Um, one of our big concern was the big empty boxes. Um, what came back, certainly from um, the, the our local community and our public, and we spoke to we spoke to over 200 people, and it was face-to-face -face conversations, which are always much richer. Um, so one of the things that uh, I would say up front, which was good, were people were recognising that town centres and high streets were no longer about big multiple retailers, you know, and what people are looking for is that mixture of independent shops. Um, the kind of things that you have to go into a shop and do um, that you can't do online, which is, for example, a hairdresser. Um, not that I would know, but that, that's, you know, so there are things there that people have to go down to, to shops for. But the, what people are definitely want to see a lot more of is culture, leisure, events. Uh, we got a lot back about having a family-friendly town centre um, and that was just people going down with the kids and something for the youngsters to do, but also grandparents who are doing, who look after their grandchildren and, again, are looking for ways that, you know, it could be a bit of an event for them as well. Um, and the other thing about Kirkcaldy is, uh, speaking for Kirkcaldy, is obviously a history in terms of, you know, Adam Smith was one of our... Uh, most famous people, and the Adam Smith Global Foundation have been trying to reclaim that. Um, so people are interested in their history and their culture. What people were also saying to us is they give us ideas that they've seen elsewhere. So again, one of our bigger retail units that's lying at 5,000 square metres, we're looking at ideas of things like having indoor artisan markets, you know, with an artisan bakery, um, a gin distillery, they got mentioned quite a lot but also having um, kind of leisure events, again, for people. So pop-up bowling alleys, for example, or even maybe small cinemas of 50, 100 people. But it's that kind of um, idea that people... Uh, and this is the public telling us that this is the kind of thing they want to see. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities to repurpose these buildings. It does come down to the, the you know, the... the the subject of filthy lucre, you know, it does require a bit of investment. And one of the things I think we all need to realise is that these are not necessarily commercially viable at the outset. You're not going to see a lot of private developers coming in and doing that. So we need to find ways of how we kickstart these projects. And again, it's down to how do we collaborate um, to see how we could take these buildings and repurpose them into the sort of things that people want to see. Just moving on from that briefly in my last question, is there merit, I mean, I've seen this in commercial properties that were traditionally, somebody would have taken the whole building that have been subletted for SMEs, often kind of micro businesses in effect, doing a similar model, but for artisans. Now, as you suggest, the, the return on investment isn't as clear cut, so it might rule out some of the bigger private uh, guys, but... Uh, and, you know, if anyone, Anthea or, or, or uh, Jamie, want to come in, can we see something like that working? Because uh, that does repurpose buildings. I appreciate there's a lot of complexity around the funding of it, if you had a public-private initiative or so on, but any last comments on that? Uh, Anthea, and I think Gemma would like to come in as well, but I'll take Anthea first. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I think it's really uh, it's a really interesting and important point because we've we've looked at this. We've got an unusual situation in Alawa, and I'm actually a director of the Alawa bid as well. So I'm we I'm wearing two hats. 
uh, and I think that's really important to to say because you have to have that collaboration happening um, right from the outset. So your governance of your your bids or whatever organisation is 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 running the sort of business community or the organisation has to be has to be representative, and so that you can shore up that. Um, kind of innovation and creativity and actually be able to pull on resources right from the outset. And I think we've, we've, we're starting to really get traction on this in Alloa, but we have to go through, we've got an unusual thing, we've slightly different than Kirkcaldic because we've got an older aging population in Alloa. We've also got a housing unit that's being built on a bit of derelict land, large, very significant, 64 units, it's for older people, uh, and it's actually going to be dementia friendly. So we, we've actually got to take a, a completely different lens as to how we look at that town centre. Now, that's not traditionally what businesses are looking at. They're wanting just traction on people coming through, but they're actually saying, no, we've got to work with the third sector. We've got to work with the health community because we've got to make this work for everybody. Uh, and that you know, makes us have to look differently. So we've had, we've had an old toilet um, in the town centre um, it closed in 2018, and we've actually been able to say, how do we look at the whole landscape of the town centre and this old building, and what do we make it? What, how do we look differently at it? So we used actually the Play Standard tool. So CTSI actually got funding to do some training for communities as the TSI across um, Club Manager, and we actually used it for the town centre because it was at the start of the elective period of the bid. It was a great opportunity to do it. We worked with our planning colleagues in the council as well. It's got 14 themes, and the four themes that came out were um, that were particularly critical. I would say it was low on everything, pretty much, across the board for Alawa. But there's four themes that were particularly um, uh, highlighted were work and local economy, care and maintenance, safety, and interestingly, influence and sense of control. Influence sense of control to me is very much about that social connectedness that's come through. I think earlier Jennifer was mentioning it, uh, and actually, uh, Danny's just mentioned it there. And then we said, well, what, what can we now do together collectively? Because we haven't all got the assets. Local government hasn't got the revenue to do things. Uh, the Business Improvement District, we only have around 100,000 a year coming in through um, normally. It's about, we invoice 132,500 for this current year. Um, what can we do? So we actually looked at, well, what could the different elements and partners could bring to that um, to, to make that change. And I think that's the bit that's been creative in our space. So the CCTV cameras have been put in um, throughout the town. That's been paid for by the Business Improvement District. Third sector has actually looked at the care and maintenance element. We've created a, a vol new volunteer group, Aller and Bloom. But we've also attracted in third sector organisations that are going to be relevant going forward. Fourth Valley Dementia Centre run by Alzheimer's Scotland. We've done a huge amount of support to bring them to Alloa and a couple of other older charities, charities for older people, have come into the town centre, as well as CTSI. We've taken over a, a, an empty building on the high street. And then we've actually taken the Scotland's town capital funding and said, what can we do with this? Because we already had this collaboration, what can we do with it that actually will also can, can improve? So we've slowed down the traffic next to this housing development and the connection to the cycleway is better. We've opened up a narrow, narrow way pathway to make it much more open and, and safer. And actually, we've invested in the old toilets. And the old toilets are actually going to be a multiple facility. Um, they're going to be uh, promoting health, volunteering. We've got e-bikes outside. But we've actually got a club manager tapestry that's been done by, by as part of the Great Tapestry of Scotland. So we're linking to that heritage and that story um, that actually, I think it's what's called slow tourism. You know, it's it's unpicking. And I think, again, Danny's mentioned that. And I think that's so true because it's it's actually what people are really connecting to. You know, both local people and people externally and visit Scotland. I would love to see visit Scotland. If you can do one thing, it's get them to stop spending money on all the existing things and actually look at some of the, you know, places that don't normally traditionally get get funding. Um, and I think it's it's how that that collaboration has worked to date and what we can have the opportunity of going forward. And I've got lots of ideas on that. But I'll let other people talk and Gemma come in. <laughs> And we, I think probably just to add as well, we've used a, a new investment model for that as well. Um, so it's, it's been set up as a community benefit society. Mm. At the moment, we are offering community shares. It's the first time we've ever done this in, in Club Manager. So local people can buy shares, £20. We're not getting a huge traction yet because I think the building's not ready to open. So I don't think people are seeing that kind of opportunity yet. 
but that is a way that we hope will fund and self-sustain it and it will have a made in clack shop in it um, as well a gift shop so it will actually be part of the, the fabric of of the retail la landscape as well as also being a health and um health promotion and active travel point thank you very much thanks Thank you. Um, I'll now move on to Colin Smith. I do understand that Gemma would like to come in, but perhaps Colin can direct his question to you first. Th th thanks very much, convener, and, and good morning to the uh, to the panel. Lots of really positive um, work taking place um, in our town centres, everything from dementia-friendly uh, housing to possibly Cottage Inn, which sounds a really good option. But, but I, I'm really keen just to, to build on Michelle's questions and, and to ask the panel, Given all these good ideas and good work that's taking place, what would you see as the main policy lever, the main piece of support you could get from the Scottish Government to make what you want to see happen in your town centres? And I suppose I could kick off with Gemma. What, what would help the bid deliver what the businesses in the town centre of, of Elgin needs? Oh, sorry. I was waiting to see if I was unmuted. I am. Um, so, thanks, uh, Colin. So, for us, I think it's basically trying to, like we're saying, create this experiences, create, um, change the high street, basically. Uh, but at the moment, looking at retail, you know, retail are really suffering. Uh, they've kind of been the ones that haven't really gotten support through COVID and things, so they actually have kind of suffered throughout this time. So it's made it more difficult for them. Um, obviously, there have been the newly announced retail strategy, um, which I have looked through, and you know, I think to me it's it's quite offensive to some of the retailers. Um, they're kind of saying that they're not really upskilling people at the moment. Um, you know, whereas I don't think that's true. I think that I think looking at upskilling people within retail actually starts at the education point. So I do think at schools they need to start educating that there is a career in retail, you know, building that into people. Um, because a lot of people will just leave from school to go into a retail job and then move on from that. Um, you know, whereas the retailers themselves, I know the ones in Elgin, they do take on students, um, you know, and upskill them themselves. So um sorry, I said I know I said like I'm going off topic here, but I have got a point. Um so um, you know, I think the retail strategy saying that, um didn't kind of. It's not like they'd kind of spoken to the retailers of what they're currently doing. Because um, I know for a fact the ones in Elgin, they certainly are upskilling a lot of their staff. Um, you know, a lot of them have trained them up, so they then moved on to be a manager elsewhere. So I do think um, recognising what the high street could be. Um, you know, I mean rates. Rates is another issue. Um, that's one that's talked about really in Elgin. Um, as soon as you go into a certain area on the high street, the rates just go extremely high, um, which is unaffordable for independents. Um, the nationals are all pulling out and leaving these the big holes within the city centres. Um, and I do think there needs to be kind of responsibility taken for that and a reevaluation of the rates, which I do believe is coming next year. Um, but you know, is it too late by then? Um, you know, have the high streets died? Has people moved on? Um, so I think looking at I think generally going and speaking to the local businesses help. Um, you see what their challenges are, uh, which is rates. Um, you know, trying to get extra funding to them, which you know during COVID it has been great for the hospitality and um, hair and beauty, so they have survived. But certainly looking at the retail, they have suffered. Um, I mean, the retail strategy as well was saying. Um, you know, their talkers can benefit from getting new kind of digital training. Um, so, in one respect, they say about you know improving their business, making it more um, futurised. But then, at the next turn, they're saying about um, redundancy for staff um, because businesses have taken on self-scan checkouts. So, you know, there's a lot of things there that I think doesn't sit well with a lot of retailers. Um, you're kind of then phasing out um, retail within the high street, which you know I don't think. Is the case. I think we still need both. We need services, um, experiences, and we need retail. Um, because retail is, you know, it was the initial part of our high street. So we need to really keep that. Um, so I think it's really looking at what the strategies are going forward and what the plans really need to be, but suiting different areas. Um, so for example, up in Murray, you know, that needs to kind of be looked at um, differently as opposed to other towns um, or cities even. 
Um, and I think obviously there's the cost of living, which has all increased. Um, so obviously there's electricity bills have all gone up. Um, I just think personally at the moment it's really difficult for independent businesses to survive. Um, you know, with everything increasing, the bounce back loans coming back. Um, so I just think there needs to be kind of some recognition around that. Obviously, um, yeah, the rates are introduced again um, slowly over this this year. So I think there's issues around that. Um, and I think I understand, you know, money has to be made back, but you know, I feel like it is businesses that are paying for this. Well, that's very helpful, Gemma. Can, 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 I, can I put the same point to, to Mark? Uh, when uh, I suppose when it comes to your your, your bid members in Linlithgow, what, what what policy initiative would you like to see, or initiatives would you like to see from Scottish government to support your your, your, your members? Yeah, um, um, definitely a, a big part of it that, that needs to change is probably around planning in terms of empowering the local authority and maybe investing. So where we've got sort of a lot of government money that's been available, there's certainly a large pots of money have been made available for town centres. If that money is used and focused at a local level, you can bring back into use some of these big empty buildings. So my background, I worked in Debenhams for 20 years, so I've lived and worked in a lot of our high streets and town centres across Scotland in that time. And just recently, I, I seen a report that said 90% of those buildings were empty. I know from when BHS collapsed, there was probably 75% of them empty still. And it's just a compounded issue that we've got these big empty spaces. Now, the big crippling factor with those buildings is the rents from those from private landlords are very high to begin with. And the, the rates on top of that are also astronomical. And that's before you pay any other bills, staffing costs and all the rest of it. So you need some people with deep pockets to invest in those buildings. And I think it's gone too far now that there isn't those sort of private companies that are going to do that. If, uh, you know, government money was made available to local authorities to invest and take over some of those buildings, they could be broken down into smaller units. There's a really good example that you could look at is um, Bobby & Co is the name they gave to the big department store in Bournemouth, where the landlord there actually had the vision to kind of bring it together, pull in lots of artists and brands and other things, create gallery space and all the rest of it to really try and revive that building. It's one of the few really, really good examples I've seen in the whole of the UK to revitalise a space. And that brings people into town. It brings footfall. The point Gemma made, I agree a lot about what she said about a retail business. So I, I've got a leisure business and I've actually opened a retail business as well. So I see the challenges from all sides. You've got to have that mix now in the town centres. We've got that growth in cafe culture at local levels, probably at the detriment to city centres because people have been working at home. And we need to keep that balance now to keep people in the local economies as well, not necessarily in the big cities all the time or big towns but in smaller towns around the country so that we get that even spread of growth and sustainability. And we talk about kind of upskilling the workforce as well. Um, you know, that is something that, that is available. Um, you know, some of the things I used to do were taking on people that have been long-term unemployed through Devon as an example. There's lots of fair companies that will provide the SVQ qualifications that are all funded and you can upskill people that way that can then go on. It improves their communication skills improves their service skills so they can go on, get pay rises and progress within those careers. And that is an important aspect. Um, but if we can if we can take over some of those buildings, uh, you know, this is a big policy change, really. It's it's how you take control of how you work with local authorities, because I, I know from working in Kokodi, like Fife Council were much more progressive and would work. Other councils are really restricted in terms of what they can do. They maybe don't have that expertise and knowledge to come out. And, and also, who can they work with as well in different communities to, to really look at the space at a local level and go, what is the solution that the people want in that town to really bring it back to life? And if we, if the government can open up that dialogue and actually help councils to develop that at a local level and entrust and empower the communities through the bids, through development trusts and any other organisation, we can really bring back a plan to bring individual town centres to life again. Uh, again, that's very, very helpful indeed, Matt. Thanks very much for that. Can I put the same question to you if I've got time to... To, I suppose, Anthea, you mentioned one example around Visit Scotland, but is there any other uh, policy initiatives that you would like to see from government to support um, the work that's taking place in, in, in Clack Manager? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I think there's, I think there's a, a lot that can be done. We've got the same issue of absentee landlords, which I think was brought up in the first panel. Well, and, and actually, it's almost needing the, the equivalent of the Community Empowerment Act or participation requests, which is an element of that, 
that you, you, you actually are insisting that people have to come to the table, those absentee landlords, in, in order to have those conversations. Um, a place, the new planning law is bringing in the place plans, but I think that is always going to, be, to benefit areas where, for example, they've maybe got stronger community councils. We don't in Alawa. I'm being perfectly frank. We've got a, a, a fairly weak, small community council, partly because it's a very deprived area. It sits within Alawa South and East, which is one of the 5% top uh, deprived areas in Scotland. Um, and so we need, and we don't have a development trust yet. I'm hoping that that's going to be something that will come out of the, the new Community Benefit Society, so we can strengthen that. But I think we need to, to be have some way or some toolkit to be able to at least allow people that they've got to insist that they get involved in a conversation about how we can use their buildings. The other side of it, and I, and I think uh, Gem has made a really valid point and be one I would make as well, there is that, um, that rates are very expensive, but could we pump prime small social enterprises to start as training organisations? We've got an organisation called CoLab that came in a couple of years ago. They've done some really good work with young people to bring them on digitally. Now, alongside that, they've actually been doing some work for the bid and they've used money that came through the Scotland's Town um, Partnership Recovery Fund. So we've now created uh, the equivalent of Amazon Marketplace. It's, it's Alloa First Marketplace. So actually somebody could come into the town centre, they could get a, a, an empty building, but actually immediately have an online platform with, with shop facilities, payment facilities and everything. So they don't have any of the costs. So it's quite innovative, but actually it's the bit about training. The organisation has done that, it's trained young people alongside. So could you do it? We've lost both our florists in the last month. No reasons other than, you know, illness actually. One of them has COVID and has and had to retire. You know, we, we wouldn't have expected that. Thriving businesses, um, so could we could we actually pump prime, uh, pay a landlord to take over their building, um, put a trainer in there with a, a couple of apprentices and actually start a business, literally start a social enterprise on the back of it that becomes that it, but that also suits obviously our changing landscape of older people within within Alawa. So I think there are things that can be done. Change of use, I think uh, again, uh, you know, I think uh, I spoke to the planners yesterday, who I speak a lot with, and they said we've been very, I suppose, reserved. I think would be and risk averse about changing, not looking at bringing housing in into shop what has been dedicated shop um, venues, um, and actually maybe it's time for us to change that. You know, and and they were being honest with them. So again, I think they they maybe that needs to be again forced a little bit that agenda a little bit more. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much for that. I, I, and finally, can I bring in Danny? You, you raised there was a lot of things happening. I've got it, Danny. I mean, I, I mean, what, what can government do to support that work? Well, I think uh, firstly. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about collaboration and collaboration at a local level, and that is so important. I mean, while the, the fundamental issues and reasons of, of, of what has happened to town centres, as I've said earlier, is common, it's the response that has to be very much localised and recognises the context of each particular um, town or what um, that we're talking about. Um, and what I would like to see uh, is that recognition that needs that really decentralised approach, not just at the council level, but actually in that community and in that settlement, uh, to encourage that collaboration, because that collaboration will mainly be between voluntary and third sector organisations, with the council hopefully enabling that. And I have to say we have experienced that uh, in a good way with Fife Council. So it's trying to make sure the funding gets distributed that way, but also that to recognise that these things do take time to plan and you need you want a good cohesive plan over the next two or three years. Um, and it would be great to get away from the situation at times because yes, there has been quite a bit of funding gone into town centres over the past couple of years um, and it's welcome. It gets a bit difficult, though, when some announcement gets made in March or April, there's a distribu distribution of funding, um, it just suddenly arrives, and by the way, you've, all, you've got to get it all committed before the end of that financial year. That does not make for good planning, and it certainly does not make good, efficient use of funds. So some kind of, and I know it's difficult at all government levels to do this, 
but some thought to longer term planning and trying to provide at least some sort of, even in these difficult times, some security that the funding could be there so we could plan properly. Um, I often hear the, the phrase uh, projects on the shelf as difficult to put projects on the shelf. It takes time to plan projects. Uh, very quickly, I'd re again, I would echo what other folk have said, non-domestic rates. Uh, uh, personally, I just think it's an antiquated system. It's a blunt instrument to, to, to collect a property tax. Property taxes are good. Um, in term, definitely in terms of local initiatives and, and local funding is used across the rest of Europe, as you know. Um, I think ours has to be a bit more sophisticated than it is. Uh, and I know that you know, the Scottish Government uh, over years have tried to look at the subject and deal with that, but it needs to be better than what it is. And it can't just be based on a rateable value and a poundage that's set across the whole of Scotland. Um, it just needs something a lot better than that. And finally, I just have to say, town centre living and working has to be a big feature to the regeneration of our town centres. Our architects and, um, have surveyed the, the high street in Kirkcaldy, and these properties that are above the retail level, over 50% of them are lying empty. Um, they are just lying there doing nothing. They're not even used as storage space. Um, they're just not felt necessary because in the, the 30, 40, 50 years we've had a retail boom, they were worthless. The focus was on the retail space. Now we've got a lot of empty property there that could provide great living space uh, and an opportunity to retrofit them and refurbish them in a way that would also be uh, climate friendly um, and provide a lot of kind of much needed uh, accommodation. It has to be said, you will not get any housing developers getting involved in that. As it requires a lot of retrofitting work, including access and stairways that have been taken away, which is not uncommon, uh, you'll find in town centres across Scotland. Um, but th that is a great way to regenerate a town centre, to actually have people living there, um, and I think, as Anthea alluded to, um, to actually have a much more flexible planning system that allows for these changes of use. Um, so uh, I think these are the kind of big policy levers we need to see kind of constructed um, to help us move forward in revitalising our town centres. Thank you. I could I bring in Maggie Chapman to be followed by Jamie Harko johnson Thanks very much, convener. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for joining us today. Um, really just following on from what both Anthea and Danny were, were talking about there, we heard this morning about the need for alignment, policy, coherence, all of the different strategies, and, and Gemma mentioned the retail strategy, all, all of the different strategies actually coming together and, and not, not replicating different work. Um, can I ask uh, Danny first, if, if that's okay, what is it you think that the different levels of government, whether we're talking about Scottish, UK governments, local authorities, and other public bodies, what is it that we need to do better to coordinate policies to make sure that we, we don't have um, repetition, we don't have conflicts, and, and, and it, I, I think importantly, we don't have big gaps? Um, yeah, I, I think to try and put this diplomatically, I mean, I've worked in local government for about 30 years. Um, and one thing about government, I think, at all levels, whether it's UK, Scottish or local government, is this, uh, has always been this issue of how do we all work better together? Um, uh, and it is difficult because uh, you, you're, you're trying to deal with different types of legislation and regulations um, and as soon as anybody's part of a department or part of a profession, they're very, uh, and I'd, I'd say this in a good way, they're very wedded to trying to do the best for what they believe is important and in, in having a good society to live in. Um, but these can clash. Um, and yeah. I think uh, it's, uh, if you don't have that cohesion at the very highest levels, um, and if you do have that bit of conflict sometimes, it will flow from the UK government all the way down, right down to, to local councils. Um, 
And you do see that happening in terms of... Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to you know, um, pick some doubt in this. Um, but, you know, simple things like, for example, um, you know, cafe culture is a big thing that people talk about now. Um, and we are uh -huh. seeing more and more people kind of sitting outside, even in the colder weather, sitting outside, drinking coffees and having their breakfasts, um, the way the Scandinavian countries have done it for years, you know, and that's again a way of people reconnecting with their town centre. But of course, if you've got a cafe and it's a pavement that's less than two metres, then there's a real struggle to try and figure out how can we get this to work. Um, now, that might sound a trivial example, um, but I think a lot of my colleagues here would say, you know, you often come against these, what seems like, Silly things, important, but why we need all the, the parts of, of government to work together on that. And it, I think it's about trying to get the very um, clever kind of approach that recognises that we need a framework of legislation and regulations, but there needs to be that flexibility there that recognises that all towns are different and they're in different situations. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, safety, people's safety, people's health have got to be paramount. Um, at the same time, uh, it's almost like what I was saying with the rates, if you have one blunt stick um, to deal with everything, um, eventually it kind of deals with nothing really. Um, and I, I think it, 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 it's that whole spirit of decentralisation, um, and I'm not talking about it structurally, but that actual culture that says, you know, we know what we've got to do, we know there are regulations around, but how do we work together? How can we be more flexible um, and allow some flexibility um, for towns to try and respond to the way that they revitalise that town centre? So I don't know if that <laughs> does answer your question. It's difficult to pinpoint one thing. It's more a culture of, as I say, working together and providing and allowing some flexibility. No, th thanks very much, Danny. That that is helpful. Um, Anthea, I wonder, could I bring you in on the same same kind of question? That the, the notion of of sort of breaking down silos, policy coherence, alignment, and coordination, coordination, so we get that holistic and joined up uh, work working. What is it that we need to be doing differently, or better, or not doing? Yeah, I mean, I think Phil Prentice brought this up in the first panel as well, yeah. actually, that, that, you know, that Scottish Government are actually create a, a mountain of sometimes strategies and documents that actually have got touch points, but are actually not pulled together very well. Um, and we see this across the third sector, obviously, a, a whole raft of, of pieces of work. I think he also picked up that issue around climate uh, climate emergency and, and that we really need to make that at the forefront of some of these discussions, because um, you know, Alloa actually has free parking. It's it's an absolute bonus. It's it's been there for um, quite, as long as I've been working there, almost six years. Um, and yet, the town set, and, and through the pandemic, we closed actually the the high street to make it safe. We brought lovely planters in and benches. It created a fantastic environment. But slowly, it's been chipped away. Um, and we're back having you know because there's no ticketing, we're back with cars on the high street again. Um, you know, we had this whole cut flowers, not cars, and we're back to having cars again. And, and it's frustrating because actually, you know, if we are going to create a different social connectedness um, around our high streets, then actually we need to, to, to be brave and actually make sure that we are, we're, you know, we're not being pushed politically, our local politicians. And in our case, our politicians are quite, you know, they're, they're a roundabout lot because we're a small county. Everybody knows our politicians. Um, you know, it means that we, you know, we have to be brave and they have to be brave enough to say, no, we're, we're actually stopping cars. We want you to walk from the very near free car parking around the corner to the town centre. And we want to create a much different atmosphere in the town centre. Partly also we've got, you know, we've got 64 new units of dementia friendly housing coming into the town centre. We have to be safe as well. Um, so th I think there is... There needs to be some priorities maybe put, and I, I don't get me wrong, I know the Scottish Government has done that and the UK Government. Um, I actually met the UK as well to add the UK Minister for Leveling Up 
uh, a couple of weeks ago wearing my sort of TSI uh, hat, um, along with SCBO, Chief Officer, uh, Chief Executive Anna Fowley. And again, really interesting, he, he really wants to work with the Scottish Government in terms of how that money, that levelling up money comes in. He's, he's very prepared actually to see gap funding going in where needed uh, uh, to make things happen. But I think the conversations are not necessarily happening yet at, the, at a political level. And I, I, I don't want to throw a bomb in here, but I think it needs to happen quicker because exactly what Danny said earlier, you know, we were lucky. We had the collaboration in place because we'd already been using, doing the test of change with using the play standard tool. Otherwise, I, I don't think it would have happened in, town, in the town centre in the way it would. We would have not got the change in the places that needed um, using that Scotland's town capital funding. So it, it, it would have maybe been a lost opportunity. So it was just good luck, actually, to some extent, that that work had already begun. And, and you can't, we can't fault a lot when we're spending, you know, millions of pounds. We've got to have a lot more better planning, a lot more co cohesive planning, a lot more strategically looking across different areas to make sure the whole thing works together better. Thanks very much, Anthea. That, that's that's really helpful. I'm mindful of time, Claire. I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Maggie. Uh, I'll now bring in Jamie Harko Johnson. Um, thanks very much indeed. Um, uh, good morning to the panel. Um, and I just wanted a question very quickly to uh, to Gemma and then maybe to Mark because of nature of um, your your kind of areas and obviously uh, Elgin and my Highlands and Islands region. Um, you know, they're both, both areas that rely um, heavily or in, in certainly kind of tourism in, is important. I just wondered, as we've talked about kind of local taxations, what your thoughts are. Uh, and what you think the impact of um, any implementation of a tourism tax uh, in your area would be on local businesses, particularly, for example, um, in the example of Elgin, if Murray went ahead with it, but say Aberdeenshire didn't and Highland didn't, whether you believe that could put, um, put you at advantage or disadvantage, how you would do that. So if I can go to Gemma first on that, and then perhaps um, to Mark. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Um, I actually think it would be a, quite a huge disadvantage to Murray. Um, I don't think it would be fair. Um, there's kind of a lot of issues around kind of the Murray Council and the Aberdeenshire Council already. Um, you know, I mean, going off topic, but our stallholders, um, you know, farmers markets and things, they actually get charged a larger fee at the moment than they do in holding their markets in other areas. Um, so I just think it adds an extra reason maybe not to visit Murray, not to have a business in Murray. Um, and I just think, um, you know, I, I generally just, for me, I can't see it being an attraction. I'm maybe just seeing it from one side. I'm not sure. Um, but to me, I don't think it's a, an advantage for Murray. Um, if we were to introduce the tourism tax, um, I don't you know. Um, and I, I don't, we haven't actually spoke to our businesses about this. Um, that's kind of more visit Murray Speyside's um, kind of area to deal with. But um, obviously, we speak with them and things. So I, that's kind of general feedback that they've said is that the businesses wouldn't want the tourism tax introduced. Um, okay, yeah. thanks. For that. And, and Mark? If there's any sort of tax on tourism across Scotland as a whole, I think that would be detrimental, really, to attracting all the foreign visitors that we get in. I think we've been lucky the last couple of years with uh, people having staycations and, and visiting different parts of the country that they maybe haven't before. But now people will start travelling abroad again. We'll lose that kind of domestic income um, and we need to really get back to thinking about how we can get tourism around now that does need to be sustainable we, we need to think about the environmental consequences of that um, and you know a big challenge i think we've got is like historic environmental scotland have kept things like the lifco palace shut um, and that again really damages small town centers because that's a great attraction for us outside edinburgh but how do you attract people the lifco will get missed off the map for example people traveling from edinburgh will go to sterling but Linlithgow will get missed out because the palace is shut, as an example. But there's so much other history to, to many of these towns and that. I, I go up to, to Dornock and visit, and it, it's amazing to see what the, the council up there have done to really kind of make tourists feel welcome. There's lots of little tourist trails and signage and things. And even to agree, that reflects in the culture of people. I was up there last summer, 
and I was blocking the pavement with a pram and an old man came up to me and I thought oh no I'm in the way and everything and he said thanks thanks for coming to Donock and I was like that's like amazing that you get that kind of experience in smaller towns around the place um, you know I think if if we can enable certainly local authorities you, you know some of the big organizations to really focus on tourism and leisure and other things like that it, that will help bring people in it will help keep people in our local towns and areas and and you know i think the point was made earlier about get visit scotland into other areas so that we can market scotland as a whole and what it has to offer because there is so much out there cultural lots of history and everything like that that we can attract lots of different people different tours and that that you can do um, on the sort of subject of tax and, and local authorities and that if, if they can be enabled and you know one of the biggest things that could happen is to take the politics out of a council level because a lot of it isn't really relevant to local people they want services provided they want business support etc and if that can be moved so that government can then have you know actually a bit more clarity enabling in, enabling local authorities to help deliver that quicker on the ground that would make a big improvement as well to, to really get people out and about Thanks very much. One of the last kind of visits I did before the pandemic was to um, was to uh, Linlithgow and um, seeing the palace there, sir, and it was an excellent, um, uh, excellent. So, um, can I ask uh, you as well, Mark, just very quickly? I mean, obviously, um, you, you know, there's been a huge amount of pressure on you. To talk about some of that, um, people not coming to visit some of the tourism sites, but the general pressures on businesses. Where do you think your town centre is at the moment in terms of sustainability? Um, you know, how do you think the business, the general kind of health of um, the businesses are um, and you know what I don't want to sound negative but what concerns do you have for that and then I'll maybe come to Gemma with the same question afterwards as well yeah, Thanks, it, it's um, it's definitely a challenge Linlithgow where it sits we're, we're outside of our you know because of the, the the geography of the area we've got the big hill between us and the rest of West Lothian in effect and uh, you know Fiona knows well the challenges that we face from different things we've talked about and got involved in, in the town as well and, and the aspects that we've got there is we, we are a bit isolated. It's also seen as, you know, generally quite a well-off area, you know, a lot of people with money and all the rest of it. And unfortunately, that creates a negative as well as I see it in terms of that it is quite a fragile environment, really. It, it might look all right on the surface. We've got generally quite good occupancy of units and other things like that. Um, but when you actually speak to business owners, you might think, well, product costs X pound, but how much profit do they actually make? Because the cost of buying those goods in, the cost of running a business on the high street and all the rest of it is actually quite high. A lot of those business owners take home very little money. They do it because they love it. They've got the passion for what they do. Um, but, but no one's getting really rich out there doing that. And, and that's not why people do it in some respects. Um, but... The, the, the sort of impact on that is, yeah, it can look all right, but if you invest across, you know, the areas as a whole, the areas that do look quite affluent and doing well, if you make them really attractive and it can be involved in the pavements, parking, all those sort of issues, so you can bring people in, you can bring the tourists in, those areas will generate more wealth as well. We, we, we had a visit from Tom Arthur and we talked about community wealth there and we, we gave him some feedback on some of the issues there that, that where government can help. And, you know, we talked about the longer term funding to get things up and running, not just these short term goals. But actually, if you improve the whole environment, you can improve the landscaping, you've got trees, you've got places for people to sit and enjoy the, the cafe culture, the bars and other things. You'll get people staying in them. There'll be more wealth generated from that in the local community can then get invested. But also, it means local authorities will have more money. They can invest in some of the more deprived areas as well to really bring them up. So we can actually create it. We can turn things around and create a really progressive culture that we invest in all areas to bring the whole country up as a whole. Um, which is a different yeah, way of and, looking at it, but it, it would make a big difference. Th thanks, and Gemma, just as well in terms of the in terms of in Elgin, how you you, you know how you feel um, kind of uh, the health of kind of businesses are, and um, you know any concerns you have or uh, or anything that you're doing to kind of um, uh, you know deal with some of those issues. Yeah, um, so we're kind of like the same as Mark. Actually, we're kind of seen as. Um, like the hub of Murray. So I think people don't tend to then visit us as much because they think go to the smaller towns. Um, obviously we're known as like the whiskey area as well. So that kind of takes an effect as well because everybody wants to go to all the distilleries. So then they don't actually visit Elgin. Um, so we do have that issue. Um, and again, around, you know, Elgin gets everything. So we, you know, we don't need to worry about Elgin, which is actually not the case at all. Since I've been in the bid, um, it feels like Elgin gets very little. Um, and I do think, as we mentioned throughout the collaboration is such an important thing and um, the main kind of issues that we have is with trying to get the cafe culture introduced into Elgin having that seats outside 
um, you know, and trying to work with the local authority to make that happen, um, it just becomes extremely difficult. Uh, there doesn't seem to be much kind of leeway for it. Um, it's just, you know, kind of a straight up no, uh, which is quite hard to, to deal with. Um, and, you know, I think what we've kind of been doing is we have actually introduced pop up shop scheme, which is actually in conjunction with um, the Murray Council. So we're doing that in partnership. And again, it's to try and introduce businesses to come in. Um, I could have said maybe for a longer period, but for a month at a time to come in, try other business, see if that works, and then they could then move into um, a vacant, other vacant property in the high street. Um, so we have been doing quite a lot of work around the vacant properties. Um, we did like research surveys, trying to find out what people wanted here, and you know it did go round down the route of um, majority was you know clothing, um, male and female clothing, kids clothing. And there was a couple of experiences, more like kind of gym bars or, um, you know, kids play areas and things like that. So we have been deal we have been actually contacting directly to people that we know are interested in opening these businesses. Um, another issue that we've got is the, you know, the vacant properties, the size of them that are left. Um, so no one can actually afford to take them on. So it would be good. I know the retail strategy does state about um, breaking them down into smaller units so they're more affordable. Um, what we've actually done as well, we've contacted one of the agents that owns like a certain area of um, vacant properties in the high street, and we have said to them, you know, there were previously restaurants. They have been multiple restaurants over the years, never survived. Um, and we've actually said to them, if you would be able to change the use into retail rather than um, restaurant, that would work much better. And we do believe the property will um, go because we've got such a high waiting list for retail. So um, the agent is actually in the process of going through that, of changing the use of the properties um, to make them basically a more viable sale, I guess. Um, so we are doing a lot more around kind of the vacant properties, and I suppose it is one of the issues is trying to drive in, you know, get that attraction. We've got a lot of businesses that independents that have been surviving for a long time, you know, and we want to keep them, um, but we do also need to bring in fresh things to make people want to come into the time. So we're hoping with the pop-up shop scheme that will make a difference and um, with a high turnover and things. Um, it's going to run for 30 months, so it's quite a long a long time. And we've actually got 30 businesses signed up with a waiting list of others. Um, so yeah, I think there's there's a lot that needs to be done. Um, but Elgin itself I think the next kind of year will be the real talent point of what businesses are going to survive from um, um, COVID. We've been really lucky so far. I think we've hope, well, I think we've got one of the lowest vacant property rates um, in a city centre, so we're at four point nine percent. So to me, I think that's quite low, um, especially when we've got quite a high population of businesses within the town centre. Um, again, as was brought up, was um, you know repurposing vacant buildings which are above retail units and again getting them into living space. We have no one currently living on our high street. We need to get people back in living on the high street. So yeah. Okay. Okay. Th thank it's going to be you. Assess assessing her. Many thanks. Thank you. Um just before I move to Colin Beatty, um Danny, do you know what Kirkcaldy's occupancy or um, I saw you give yeah. us <laughs> <laughs> Um, when we started off at Love and Langton, um, that was a couple of years ago, our, our floor space vacancy rate was around 32%. Mm -hmm. So you're doing a great job, Gemma, honestly. Okay. So. Thank you. Um, Colin Beattie to be followed by Fiona Hislop. Thank you, Vera. You know, over the various sessions we've had and uh, the information we've received from witnesses, including yourselves, I'm struck by the fact that... Uh, both local government and national government uh, need to provide some financial support, certainly in the initial stages. And there's talk about uh, the need for uh, rate re business rate relief. There's talk about uh, evening up the competition between online providers with uh, local providers by bringing in some sort of digital sales tax. To what extent is the, the models that we're looking at dependent in the long term on some form of external subsidy? Is there a point at which they become self-sustaining? And is there actually milestones leading to that? I'll maybe ask Anthea to come in first on that one. Thanks very much. I think, without a doubt, the, the recovery money that went through, for, and that was there was several stages, actually. So there was uh, stage one went to bids, 
think stage two went to bed, stage three actually was available to other local, other smaller towns, and I'll, I'll come on to that in a minute, and stage four back to bids. They, they've been crucial, actually, because the level of the levy bid, there's nothing you can do. You can send out sheriff orders um, till forever, and they still will not buy into it. We've, we've got a, a card provider, card shop, um, who is, has suddenly decided, yes, they really want to pay the bid levy. They want to get the benefits of being in the bid. They're actually now having to pay £2,000 for the last four years of unpaid levy before they get to the point of starting to pay their levy for this, this year. However, they're, they're making that commitment and they're going to do it. So it, it kind of gets to a point where it's almost not worth them and they just keep rejecting the sheriff orders. So you've got so that extra money that has come in actually through the the through the those that funnels from um, Scottish government has has been absolutely crucial for for Alloa. We've used it to to, to say boost the uh, create the Alloa marketplace, which has given this online platform for local businesses, and that's been particularly successful for the butchers, the fruit merchants. They're doing daily deliveries, and that's what's paid for it. We've done banners that highlight the local heroes and the heritage. So again, they look they look great. Um, we've used it for, we had Storm coming um, last year, which is this huge kind of um, walking puppet, but 3,000 people came into the town. Now, then they might not come back, but they might also go, do you know what, that was a really easy town to walk around. It was free parking. I could get to Boots and whatever and a few other places and have a nice cup of coffee within a short period of time. So I would definitely say for a period of time, I think the Scottish Government need to keep putting that extra bit of money in um, to, to help that, in a sense, through this transition period, and I think Emma's, Gemma was right, you know, we, we, we don't quite know and mark the fragility yet of the sector, of the retail sector. I mean, our retail in, in, in Alloa is down to less than 30 percent um, of the town centre venues, which is, is hugely different from what it was, you know, a while ago. So I think there is a transition period where, yes, I would definitely say you need to be putting that extra investment in uh, and how you do it is is you know, is complex, actually. I would probably just use the bids as much as possible. When I said the small towns, we only have one business improvement district for a town. We have Clax first, which covers the industrial areas. So actually, it, for the recovery period, I was very aware that, you know, Tallybody or Dollar or Alva or Clackmannan were getting none of the support, the recovery support. Um, so actually the TSI, just because I happen to be a director of Alloa First, I recognise the importance of it. I put in a bid for that for that funding and actually got banners shop local um welcome back all these things on all the other kind of small towns around Clark Manchester. and uh, if you don't have a traders forum or don't have that you need to some other vehicle to do that and the local authority certainly didn't have the capacity at that time to do it we also got a video made a couple of videos made you know promoting the tourism so using the e-bikes um and also visiting dollar so that again was drivers. Now those that was done by the Development Trust and, and the TSI. So you, you've got to look at the fabric and the capacity of an area as well to say what else, what else can we put in here or what capacity needs to be helped? How can we enable these smaller towns to also flourish uh, and get back on their feet? Mark, perhaps I can bring you in there. Yeah, um, I think it's, it's a really interesting question about the, the support and the, the amount of money coming through from the government has been fantastic to support different things and top up. Um, I mean, in the past for like bids, certainly, you know, the percentage of funding that maybe local authorities would put into it was certainly a higher percentage would give you more money then to deliver projects. And that's certainly been cut back massively now to maybe just the contribution of buildings and maybe 10 percent on top. Um, the, the point about investment, I believe we need a different approach to it slightly in terms of we need to look at government money almost like as zero interest loans or investments in communities so what you could do we, we've talked about this before because we've got a need for it in our town you know i know in kakodi there's a need for it there's, there's areas that need redevelopment uh, buildings are out of date and so on um, so in in the lift you've got the whole venal area right in the center of town next to the cross the whole historic heart of the town if that money was provided to invest in terms of the actual development. So in terms of not selling it off to a private developer, but be keeping it in public ownership for public wealth and all the rest of it, an asset for the town, that could be de developed into smaller shop units for cafes, uh, galleries, you know, whatever. You could have that whole mixture with the housing above. You know, it could be social housing. It could be housing that's rented out to, to business executives because you've got good access to the stations for people travelling to the cities, etc. 
there'd be a return on those buildings, the rent from the shops, uh, rates and other things. There'd also be the rent to that. So over a long period of time, that investment, the capital cost of building that would actually pay back. And then you've got that money to invest again in other improvements. So if we, if we took a different viewpoint to it, one of the things we talked about as a town, and this was with our local councillors and development trust, was that where well, we've got these pots of money and we apply for it, and you touched on this before, you know, that money's there, it's short term. Some of that money's probably wasted because you haven't got time to really plan and cost the most effective way of delivering an improvement. And if you take the best approach, you know, through the pandemic, certain things cost an awful lot of money, whereas we know those prices come down. If you can invest and you've almost got that seed funding, so you've got some capital to invest, but then there's a little bit of seed funding down the line and down the line again, it means that those opportunities, those growth things can become sustainable, establish themselves, and that way then they do become self-funding. Slightly different uh, question. The, the committee's heard uh, a number of occasions that one size fits all doesn't work uh, in terms of what's trying to be achieved in our town centres. Uh, and the key to success is working really effectively with the local community uh, and uh, businesses to establish this regeneration. The one thing we haven't seen is good examples of where this has happened, not just on a project basis, because there are plenty of projects around that have been very successful, but on a, a plan basis for the town centre, where the town centre has been successfully regenerated, bringing together all the different elements of local communities and so on. Danny, can you, can you give me an example where that's happened? In Kirkcaldy? Uh, not oh. necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe Kirkcaldy. Yeah. I, I mean, we're at, we're at the early stages of that um, just now. Um, uh, and the work we've been doing, which started off as a feasibility study, um, and we called it The Future Is Now, uh, is now at a stage where we are about to produce a, 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 basically like a shared vision document um, based on the feedback that we have received from our community. And we will go back to them just to, uh, you know, in the spirit of good community engagement principles to say, this is what you said to us, is this right? Um, and that gives us the basis then to start looking at other sources of funding to do some of these bigger projects that, that we talked about um, earlier. One of the examples and the good examples we've seen of that, uh, and we, we kind of think we're just maybe a wee few years behind them, uh, has actually been the Mid Steeple Quarter project in Dumfries. I don't know if any of you know about that. Uh, uh, well, you will see a great example there. Um, but that's taken them quite a few years to get to that stage. Um, but that is a very good example of a community-led regeneration project um, starting from uh, kind of small be uh, beginnings. I'm trying to remember, I was going to say the stove or something was the, uh, you know, the kind of the birth of the embryo of it all to actually doing something that became uh, what I understand to be now is a £4 million project with community shares involved. Um, so I think that indicates the direction, the travel um, for, for doing projects like that. And it's certainly a bit of the model and a bit of the influence and inspiration, I have to say, that, that we're following. Um, and, you know, as you asked, are we, is it around external funding? When does that become self-sustaining? As I said earlier, um, some of these projects will not come from the private sector. And there needs to be the external funding, the, um, uh, you know, the, the intervention from whatever government level to get these projects off the ground. But I, I, I totally agree with Mark, they must be seen as an investment. Um, and you know, we mentioned about town centre living and the amount of empty properties. Um, they are right for some sort of social housing investment. It would be a big investment, but the return would be huge. It's not just about providing uh, accommodation and then bringing in the rents that accommodation will bring. It actually brings people living into a town centre. You know? And as somebody simply put it, if you live in the town centre, you're more likely to shop around the town centre. But it also gives it a lot of circulation and makes it more active. And the more active a town centre looks, 
you know, you create that upward spiral of the more interesting it becomes and the more people go to it. So we need to have that kind of vision um, that that's the kind of town centre regeneration we want to see. That's the revitalisation. And I think if you've listened to, you know, you listen to Anthony and Gemma and Mark, you know, you're seeing people on the ground who are enthusiastic about what they want to do and are winning their communities over to that. And that's the best investment you could make in town centres. That has to be financial, but it needs to be financial, a bit of long-term planning, a wee bit of security, but a belief that we all share that the return is going to be very worthwhile. Some progress, thank you. Um, Fiona has to be followed by Gordon McDonald. Uh, thank you. I'll come first to Anthea and then to Mark. Um, we've heard that there's a considerable amount of funding now available for town centres which can be used. Um, and we also know there's a, a great deal of entrepreneurialism in the third sector, but also in the business improvement districts. Do you think now that that would enable um, that collaborative working with councils to work better? Because clearly they maybe have been in a, a period where they have been risk averse because it's been very tight financially in that, that period of austerity. So can you maybe give me a view on that and what enablers would help that culture for bigger projects, perhaps potentially, because people want to see the value from a bid. And if it's a smaller project, perhaps they don't see that. So does this open up capabilities that perhaps weren't there maybe five years ago? Absolutely. I mean, culturally, uh, in the last five years, we've moved so, so far. And that's partly, I think, I alluded to the fact our councillors are quite close to our local community and club manager. Um, they all somehow didn't want to let go of their own area and their own patch and maybe al allow that kind of community empowerment to happen. They actually, quite frankly, got to a cliff edge where in some areas they, they had to release, for example, five village halls um, that were, were being managed by the council all in one go. Um, but actually, on the back of that, it's been hugely successful. And I think the town centre, I think we've seen also that that move to uh, to accepting. A, 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 and there's got to be a quality. I think Danny touched on this, a quality of understanding of what people, different partners are going to bring to the table. Um, I mean, that's why I'm, I'm trying a community interest benefit company for the first time. It's also going to be a charity. So it has got that sort of a little bit of backup. But, you know, the, the aim is exactly what Mark was saying there, that they're investing using the Scotland's Town Fund in what was the old toilets could have lain there forever. And, and it was the third sector who came forward, myself and a couple of others said, you know, why don't we turn this into an active travel hub? But it could be so much more. Well, you know, it's, it's going to be an amazing building that's going to, to actually be, a, you know, a proper running business. It's got to be a business. It's got to be a business from the outset. There's no trying, trying to pretend. Charities are businesses. Um, we, we have to operate in a different way. And I think the recognition that this could actually, in the end, so we're getting three years of rent-free money, but we actually have to probably start paying rent in three years. So that investment will come back. So I think we want to see that happening absolutely in other areas. Um, you know, could there are, there are other lovely historic buildings, actually. Some of them are owned by the council. Could actually, now that the, the, the office kind of environment is changing, people are council officers, for example, are not coming in as much. So could some of those buildings be repurposed to different uses? That's what I've got my eye on next. Uh, we also have no swimming pool now in Club Manager. It's closed. Um, they're looking at uh, creating um, a new wellbeing campus which is uh, an hub, which is fantastic. Again, we'd like to keep it near the town centre so it's easy for access, it's inclusive as possible. Is there opportunities there for the third sector to be more involved? We're also a bit wary about swimming pools because they're very high cost, so it has to be a mixed model. But I think there's real opportunities there and how it integrates better with some of our poorer, more deprived areas. As I say, I, I touched on training. You know, could we, could we be using some of the empty vacancies to be actually little mini colleges in themselves? Uh, and that, that's where I see real opportunity to, to come going forward. So, yes, I think it's a cultural change that's happened. It's continued to happen. And I think it's they've just got to let go a little bit more. <laughs> that's all. OK, thank you. And uh, to Mark, and very briefly and for the record, we acknowledge that there is no proposal for any tourism tax in West Lothian and that Lunasco Palace is actually closed because there's unsafe masonry. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, that point about that culture change and the fact that business improvement districts could do more, um, 
what do you think would enable business improvement districts and in your experience to do more and you talked about doing bigger projects because isn't there a risk that business improvement districts if they do small things have a challenge in justifying what they're doing and therefore how do we get that trust uh, with all the public sector bodies to, to give to empower uh, business improvement districts to do more yeah, I, I mean, it's a really key point. I mean, some of the key, the sort of key words that we've we've talked about as an organisation and working with the Development Trust and, and other groups in meetings is, you know, we need to really empower the local community, and that could be the, the reason the bids the great vehicle for that is that's the one that's got funding, it's got employed staff that can deliver things. A lot of other organisations rely on volunteers, and that becomes more difficult to be able to do that. So there's always that resource element to be able to plan and and do that. But if if you know, we've got that empowerment and are enabled to do that, working with local authority and accessing their budgets. There's got to be a trust basis. Um, and the big part of that is between private and public sector, really. Everyone needs to work together to really drive that. Um, we, we've seen it, and it is, it is difficult to bring everyone together and get everyone on the same page and all the rest of it. But we've, we've achieved that in our town. We've, we've got, you know, the Development Trust. We've involved many of the community groups through the community council, um, like the, the High Street Traders Group, and um, even the church as well. They've got big plans to build a hub and development to bring people into the town. And th there's more that needs to be done with it. I think, to a degree, if the local authority had that sort of trust and and able to let go of things as well. For example, over the years, they've had to stop doing certain things, providing Christmas lights and all the rest of it, which the bid picks up. But that then uses up a lot of bid money. We had a good example where, if the Empowerment and Trust was there, we had the opportunity to run the car park in the town or could have taken that on as a community asset. It's a really simple business model. People park the car, you charge them a certain amount of money, you've got that money. We worked out that we could have employed a local person to sort of look after that, maintain things, sweep the car park and things as a part-time job. But the surplus from that would generate community wealth that we could have used to fund things like the Christmas tree, the Christmas lights and other things like that, which then means you've got more money available to do other things. So it's just thinking about what income streams you can make, how we can do that. There is more work that needs to be done, but I certainly think through the pandemic, it's created that opportunity for everyone to be able to work together um, and do that. And we need to do more of that to, to, to make things happen. And, and very briefly, Danny, because of your previous experience like working for the council, but also working with community groups, what are the key elements culturally to, to, to enable people to, to have that trust and to, and particularly for local authority, to pass over power to decision making to local communities? Uh, I think it is down to the local authority having that trust. And we talked about you know, you know, local authorities can be risk averse and we can all know why that, that happens. But as well, building up a relationship with that community. Um, and I would say, in fact, we're kind of lucky because we've got this seven area um, set up um, and it does allow for a certain amount of decentralisation. So there's always been a good, there was always a good relationship between the Kirkcaldy Area Committee and the bid at the time. Um, and I think it's when you create that kind of relationship, because trust, you have to build trust and you have to build in relationships. Um, it just doesn't harm overnight and it just doesn't harm because you happen to give somebody a bit of money or a grant. So I think you need to build up that trust. But I think, again, what I've heard a lot of this morning, again, from all the colleagues is around the importance of collaboration. And I think one of the best things the local authorities can do is encourage that collaboration and give the support that's needed um, for a range of organisations, and all towns will have a range of organisations that could come together um, and then do the work that is necessary uh, that they feel they can do to actually revitalise their town centre. Um, and that the funding that does come is to really trust that organisation with that funding um, and that's why I come back to why it's important that if you know the funding's going to be there, I know you'll never know the exact amounts, but if you know it's there, you can plan. Um, and if you can plan, you can demonstrate to the local authority of, we've got this and we're on top of this. And not only that, we actually talked to the community and this is what they told us. You, you, it really is about culture and trust. And if you could build that up, it can really work. Uh, Danny, you spoke about the number of empty units in Kirkcaldy and the 50% of the space above the retail units were lying empty. And I had a look at your website and, you know, it was quite impressive the 
uh, the vision that you guys have got for the area in terms of cafe culture, independent shops, market spaces and so on. What are the barriers that are stopping you from making use of these empty properties? Uh, well, what, one of the biggest ones um, by far, and I think this was, uh, I suspect this was touched on this morning, is landlords and property owners. Um, so, uh, again, I don't think our quarries are coming in this. The vast majority of the property, um, and uh, certainly in the high street, um, will be owners who don't live in Kirkcaldy, don't live in Fife, some don't even live in Scotland, a lot of um, what you would describe as absentee landlords, um, trying to pin them down, uh, what, sorry, what I mean by that is trying to find out who they are, uh, trying to get in touch with them. Um, you know, they're, they're not interested in doing anything. What, I'm saying that one or two are, but the costs are very prohibitive, okay? And I, I'm serious, in fact, we're looking to, we were looking at a property, um, four storeys, big retail unit at the bottom, three levels above. We had a look at that because uh, we're looking to open an, an enterprise hub. Uh, again, sort of things Anthea was talking about, training, support, etc. cetera. Um, it's a beautiful sandstone building, has a, uh, a fabulous purpose. Because there's a lot, they, these properties are gorgeous. I mean, they are great architecture, big rooms. Uh, they have a lot to offer, um, but for us to see the one that we were looking at, I had to go up this rickety ladder <laughs> into a hatch on the, the first floor in order to climb in to see the property above it because the external staircase had been taken away. And I say to you that is not uncommon. Um, they've not been touched or used as, as the, I mean, they've been maintained and kept wind and watertight. Um, but it's not just the gaining the access, it's all the fire regulations now. Uh, and again, if you've uh, done any work with local authorities and high streets, noise regulations are really prohibitive now. And, and the amount of soundproofing, especially if you're above a pub or something like that, it is a lot of money. Uh, and that really uh, prevents uh, these properties. Because if they were commercially viable, I could assure you there'll be developers in there to turn them into flats. It's just very expensive. So what, what can we do to incentivise um, commercial property owners to, to bring their building back into use? I don't... Uh, it would probably have to be a variety of things. We'd get back into looking at property taxes. They, they, you know, would you change the system? Would you give them... a uh, I, I don't know, it would be some sort of subsidy, um, it would be kind of being a bit lenient around the regulations, uh, and to be honest, I'm not even sure if that's something we really want to do. Um, I'm sorry, I'm really struggling to see how you'd get a commercial developer wanting to do that. I think we'd be far better going down the route. Uh, look, we've got so many social, great social housing associations, length and breadth of Scotland, as well as the local authorities. Um, and, you know, the, the other thing about getting social landlords to do stuff like that is it gives you something that we don't have in town centres, a long-lasting, permanent, regular landlord that's going to be there for the long term. Uh, and that makes things a whole lot easier as well. Okay. Anthea, you uh, touched upon the need for uh, accommodation for start-ups. Um, how, how much demand is there in your area for uh, retail units and what are the barriers for folk getting access to the retail units? Well, interesting. I mean, that, you know, there has been change. Uh, I, I was looking quickly at our figures, actually, in terms of um, the uh, aloe, where it's sitting about 10% vacant. There's been an additional house that was sitting slightly outside, uh, within the bid area, but just outside the town centre that was artist residence. So that's taken back, uh, given up by the landlords and handed back to the council. So kind of slightly distorts the figure. So we, we're not too affected because the, the vacant properties are spread over several streets. So you're not seeing this kind of linear, you know, um, you know, impact, which I think certainly has helped Alloa, for example. But I think uh, we have seen some turnover um, in the independence, but I think we are seeing an overcapacity in some areas. Um, nail bars, actually, um, for example, and health and beauty in particular, um, and nail bars have been unfortunately associated with serious crime 
actually in our in Alawa as well in modern slavery. So we we you know we are looking you know and I do think there needs to be some you know we we can't re let regulations go, but you know they're being allowed to come in and 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 use these buildings. Are they the right buildings? Have we properly you know checked them? Um, so we have seen turnover happening, um, but I think there's I think there's opportunities to drive a slight change in the look of building you know it's having a conversation with some of the third sector social enterprises that we have and say or businesses who might be interested with to provide social benefits so it is back to that community wealth building angle would you bring your business if we we helped you uh with a year's rent with uh we and you trained up a couple of apprentices would you would you have a go you know, and, and that's the question we've got to go out and ask. I think we, you know, again, it's got to be market driven in the end. But, you know, you say you've, you've got this aging population, you've got older people. Would a shoe shop work? Would a hearing hearing company um, work? You know, um, you, you've got to look at would a lingerie company work? You know, you, you, we don't know. And I think there is an element of having some risk in there and finding some, you know, creating some money that actually is around seed money that would actually stimulate stimulate some of the shops and environments so we don't see this change and turnover quite as much and variety I think everybody likes variety within a shopping area don't they yeah and uh, Gemma I was wanting to ask you about the Elgin loyalty card uh, how successful that's been in supporting independent businesses and whether it attracts businesses to the town the fact that you have the Elgin loyalty card um, so I wouldn't necessarily say it actually attracts businesses. Um, they tend to find out about it more once they came and spoke to us about opening a business initially. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that. But you know, I think it's been effective in actually keeping the loyalty there from shoppers. Um, one hundred percent. I do generally think it has made people think about supporting local more, shopping local more. Um, so it has definitely driven that. And the fact is as well that. Every quarter, um, we do a prize draw for them to win a hundred pound Elgin gift card. And um, so again, the gift card is only spent within our members. Um, so it's keeping that money local. It's given them an incentive to, to keep supporting local. So it has given that drive, and it has raised awareness of what we have in Elgin. Um, it's definitely promoted the businesses. It's promoted Elgin bid itself. Um, so it has done that and support definitely. I know you said you had a low vacancy rate, but do you have an issue with mm -hmm. empty properties in Elgin? Yeah, we do. So, um, pretty much what Danny was saying, we have a lot of absentee landlords as well. Um, a lot of our business in the upper floors, especially, would be classed as derelict. Um, the roofs are caving in. They're actually probably a hazard. Um, and for me, the way to kind of get around that, I would say, is giving power to the local authority to actually penalise these owners um, if they haven't maintained their buildings. Um, I think that's the only way. But there is obviously the incentive to help them as well. So it's penalising them. You know, if they get them up to the standard and then they let that standard drop again, I think then penalise them. Um, because we had the Conservation Area Regeneration Scheme in 2018 in Elgin. Uh, we were trying to contact landlords to say you can get this work done for free. We can obviously, um, you know, help improve your building, regenerate it, and they never got back in touch with us. Or some of them have taken it on, which was free work to um, improve their building, and they've not maintained it. So four years later, their buildings go back to the state that it was in previously. Um, so I think there needs to be something around that. You know, that was a three million pound project that needs to then. You know that's three three million pounds just gone, and um, we'll never get the regeneration scheme back again. So I I think there should be a, you know, some sort of fine or something to these to these landlords to say you need to keep your building in you know a decent state, and um, because at the end of the day it does become a health you know a health and safety issue. People are walking along the high street and plates or something are falling off the roof. You know that that's dangerous. And um, so I think there needs to be kind of maybe more work around actually looking into the buildings and seeing how safe they are. Because like I say, there is a lot of buildings um, with the roofs caving in. Um, as kind of Danny said, I was the same. I was in a three-storey building and we couldn't even get up to our four story, we couldn't even get up to the top floor because the staircase was rotten with water coming in. Um, so that's it. It's kind of like the base units are kept watertight and you know kept in good standard, but the upper floors are just left to, to rot basically. Okay. Thanks very much. 
Um, thank you. Um, thank you very much to the panel this morning for your contribution to the inquiry. That has been um, extremely helpful. Are members now content to take the final items in private? Uh, I'll now move into private session. <laughs>